I really pressed people even then to believe God for the ridiculous, the sublime, the over the top, the unfathomable. And uh, so I would play what we just called miracle videos and I scoured the internet looking for legitimate, not the fake. I saw this one in Africa. It was this little lady. She's about this high and her arm was all jacked up, you know, and somebody's praying for her and oh man, here the arm goes straight. And I thought, wow, isn't that wonderful what God did? until I saw her on 12 other channels with 12 other ministers getting the same prayer, doing the same thing, and I thought, oh, man. And that's the kind of reputation that those that are functioning in the real are getting. Now, listen to this. There would not be a need for a fake if there wasn't a real. <laughs> Come on. Hallelujah. So I scoured the Internet looking for these videos to find something that bore witness in my spirit. And one of them was, uh, was of an Indian man that was, that was dead. And I had this on my computer now for years. So I'm talking to a mutual uh, acquaintance here, a friend of yours and new to me. And I said, what is one of the greatest miracles that you've ever personally seen when you've been hanging out with this weird guy called Todd? <laughs> and he said, well, he said, we were overseas in India. And he said, the backstory is... He said, I'm not sure if the man was really dead or not, but he sure appeared to be because his daughter had him on life support for four weeks. And the doctor said, no brain activity. And somehow or another, they got the apparatus taken out of him, put him in the back end of an ambulance, drove him to the meeting where Todd was at, and slicked him out on the floor. And then they yelled for him to come over. And I said, now, wait a minute. Where did this happen? How long ago was this? Because in my mind, I'm thinking, I think I saw this video, but I don't remember Todd being in it. And so he goes, no. He said, I'm telling you, he said, it was Todd. He said, I was there. He said, you need to go back and look at that video again. I said, hang on a minute. Click, 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 click. And I found it. So I'm watching. And I see this tattooed arm right in the middle of him just shoving on this guy. And I said, okay, that, that, that might be Todd. That, that might be. And then when the guy comes back to life and the look on his face, guys, the look on his face, somebody's talking to him like, are you okay? How you feeling? He's, a, he's just kind of looking like I I'm hearing you, but he's looking around and I'm sitting there in my mind thinking the last time this guy was conscious, he was probably at home, went comatose, doesn't know he was in the hospital. Now he's in, in throngs of people that are screaming at him and saying, live, 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 live. And he's waking up going, what in the world? And, uh, and so sure enough, for about a second and a half, Todd's behind him, and he's got his hand on his head like this. You see that big old red, red beard of Todd's? And I said, sure enough, there he was. So here, here, in no excuses, years ago, I was playing one of his videos and had no idea that, A, he was in it, and B, one day he'd be visiting here with us. What a deal. So... I, I want you to hear there's no rock stars in the kingdom of God except the Holy Spirit. Oh, he's the only rock star there is or has, has a need of. But I'm so grateful that God has gifted each of us differently, not only with personalities, but with anointings. And when I find somebody who's got an anointing that's a bit different than mine, I understand. Listen, I love the occasional vegetable. I love the occasional ribeye hallelujah but if you have all of one thing you're going to be unhealthy we need a full diet and so the Lord provided an opportunity through my relationship with Jim and Tina Grounds and you know how weird they are and so it just it just worked out <laughs> it just worked out uh, in this season for Todd to come and I believe that it's strategic there's a number of things that I know in the natural of what's happening in members of this body uh, that, that I know this is a strategic season for this house, for this ministry, for this, for this area. And I just don't believe that it's any accident on the calendar that Todd is here today on June the 2nd of 2023. And so I'm going to ask you just to give him a warm welcome as he comes. Would you guys give it up for Todd Bentley?
Wow, come on, Jesus is awesome, isn't he? <laughs> Gotta give it up for Jesus. He gets all the glory. We're just along for the ride. And I'm telling you, the ride is awesome. It's taken us to 73 countries by the grace of God. In the last 25 years, we just celebrated 25 years in ministry full-time. Mother's Day. Can't forget a day like that, right? Mother's Day. God called me into ministry full-time on Mother's Day, 1998. So my wife was able to join me. We were in Jacksonville, Florida, celebrating 25 years. And I don't know where all the other days went because the last six weeks has been a blur. Because I've been everywhere from Pittsburgh to New York to New Jersey to Jacksonville to Lakeland to Memphis, Tennessee, just to name a few cities. And that's just in the last six weeks. And uh, God has been on a move and it's almost impossible to kind of keep up with all the stuff that's happening. And I've seen this happen before at different times. It's like the anointing happens, it's always moving, it ebbs and flows. And then you hit these high times where God just starts doing stuff. And I would say it was around back in early March, February, I got to spend a few days in the Asbury revival. Remember when that broke out, the college revival? So as soon as it happened, I heard on the sixth day, God was moving, and it reminded me of revival. I was like, I need to be there, because I can't be a revivalist and preach revival and then not be the first guy to show up when revival happens, even if it's not your revival. <laughs> I didn't know where a lot of my other preacher friends were because it wasn't their revival. But you see, that's not the way it works. We should be so excited about what God's doing. We ought to be first there. And I was like on a Monday night at the altar on my face, day six. And people are like, what's he doing up there? That's a Methodist revival. Why is Todd Bentley at that revival? And I went, I can't show up and enjoy the love and the holiness of God and repent too. And, and you know, I, I'm here to receive like everyone else. But after that meeting, I realized for about two weeks everywhere I went, it followed us just that sovereign atmosphere of love and holiness. That's what I would describe the two major things that I saw as a takeaway when we went up to Asbury was you could feel the tangible love and the tangible holiness of God. You just wanted to get on your face and get lower and lower. And so it was a real time of refreshing for me. And uh, I had a couple of my team meet me. I put the word out to my associates, you better get here. And some did, and we just had a great time. It was a time of refreshing. But every meeting after that, the tangible love of the Father. And you know what people were saying about that outpouring? You know, it spread to a lot, I think, 50 different campuses, 50 different colleges. And that was awesome. But here's what people were saying about it. It was sovereign. And, and you know, really, isn't every revival sovereign? Isn't everything that God does sovereign? But there's sometimes God moves in response to what we're doing. And that's faith, right? And I'm a faith guy. That's my background, faith guy, miracle guy. So God, you know, he responds to the word. And we move out in faith and God responds, obedience, right? So sovereignty, of course, everything is sovereign because, you know, God knew what was going to happen before it happened. But real revival is sovereign. Like when I was in Lakeland, Florida in 2008, I had a revival there 15 years ago, and we just celebrated the redigging the wells of revival in Lakeland, Florida. Jim and Tina were there 15 years later. And it's like we stepped right back into the well that was there 15 years earlier, even though we were gone from Lakeland for 15 years. So I literally just went back in the last few weeks, and it's like we stepped into the healing well again. And since that meeting, we've had about 300 testimonies of miracles and notable miracles. Now, I'm going to share a few testimonies in a moment, but sovereignty. I mean, that's what I really, it was like a breath of fresh air when I walked out of the outpouring in Asbury because I said, man, this isn't based on anything that anybody's doing. God just chose to show up and pour out his spirit. Didn't that take a lot of the ownership on us and what we think we are doing or not doing and we tend to like, let's get back to the green room and you know, navel gaze a little bit 
maybe we're not praying enough or fasting and then God just totally blows us away and he, you know that's what happened to us in Florida the first time I didn't see it was coming people go did you have any prophetic words I went no not till I got there and a lot of times I don't get stuff people are like you, what are you going to preach in Oklahoma I said I don't know I'm not there yet When you got a lot of meetings like I do, my head would be too full with trying to figure out what God's doing everywhere. And I can barely keep my own head on and my own family and my own life. So how I hear God, and I tell people this, is that God started moving with me about 15 years ago in revival, and he would only give me 24-hour cycles of, like, revelation for what you're going to do tomorrow night. You're going to preach on whatever. And I wouldn't see past that Friday night. I wouldn't know what I was preaching Saturday. Wouldn't know what I was preaching Sunday. And that stresses a lot of preachers out that want to write out their sermons for 365 days and know what they're preaching for a whole year. I was like, I don't know how you get a whole year's worth. But I'm a daily bread guy. God, give me my daily bread. God works in 24-hour cycles for me. You know why? Because I want to hear God every day. Not just once for 365 days. I make it my goal today if you hear his voice. You ever thought about that? Why does it say today if you hear his voice? Do not harden your hearts. Why? Because every 24 hours his mercies are new every morning. And you have a chance to come out of rebellion and not rebel to the voice of God and get yourself in obedience every day. Because his mercies are new every morning. Is that not what the Bible says? Give us our daily bread. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Why? Because we blow it every day. And, and you might be thinking, well, I don't blow it in all the top, big, major, outright sin. But we blow it in some of the things that I think are more concerning to the Lord. In fact, if you just read in your Bible in Proverbs 6, imagine a letter was done on every believer out of Proverbs 6. Gossip, slander, evil speaking, the issues of the heart are the six sins that the Lord detests the most. And we all tend to, you know, come short on those things because we come short in our own life when it comes to everyday attitude. Work, family, life, kids, dealing with people you don't want to deal with, neighbors. We have the test every day. And then you sleep and you get up and the test starts again. So we can make the choice... Where are we going to be tomorrow? So anyways, I started hearing God in 24-hour cycles because how I hear God before I do a meeting is one, it's not just about the message. I want to get the words of knowledge. I want to get direction for what God's going to do and who he's going to heal before I show up. That doesn't mean God's not going to move sovereignly and just tell me stuff whenever, but sometimes I'll wait, you know, in my hotel, 4 o'clock, you know, I usually walk down. Don't call me after four. I got a meeting at seven. That's my prayer time. And that's not my intimacy time. That's in the morning. Prayer, secret place, read the Bible, get out of bed, morning, coffee, whatever. But four o'clock is my ministry prayer time. There's a difference there. A lot of preachers don't keep up on this. All of our prayer life is about the preaching and the doing and the ministry. And our whole life with God revolves around being in the ministry. And then we don't even know, what if you didn't have a ministry? Would you still have God? That was always my challenge. Because I walked away from it a few times, tried to quit a few times. You know, been through my challenges in the last 25 years of preaching. Tried to throw in the towel more than one time, walk away from it all. And in the end, it was always down to, if I was facing burnout or whatever, it was intimacy with God. Separate from when I wanted to pray and get words of knowledge and what am I preaching tonight? What am I doing in a revival? Because a lot of what I do, my revivals will go seven days a week. And then after two weeks, we'll take a day off. Go six days a week when revival breaks out somewhere. Not always that way, but usually that's the way it goes. So it's not just preaching on Sunday. Maybe Wednesday night. I get up every day, it's just going to be like I'm a Christian. I love Jesus. I get in my Bible and I pray every morning. None of that prayer time is about anything I need, and it's not about ministry. I don't let it into the prayer room. That's called the secret place. Nothing comes into my secret place 
but me with the Lord. Four o'clock is my ministry prayer time because I'm getting ready for a meeting at seven. So I separated them. And that just kind of helped in my own mind where I knew that I was keeping up on my intimacy, not just the work of ministry. Because that's where you burn out. The work of revival and ministry will burn you out. The politics of ministry will burn you out. But Jesus will never burn you out. So, you know, somebody asked me this question just the other day. What do you preach in Oklahoma? And I said, well, let me tell you how God uses me. I'll use you only get, like I remember one time when I was in a revival, God said, for the next 10 nights, 10 nights of anointing. I went, great. So what are we going to do for anointing? Then the Lord would tell me, Friday night, we're going to have a healing anointing. That's it. I wouldn't see Saturday, Sunday. But, and I would make this announcement. I remember in Florida, this was back when I was in Lakeland. And at that time, we could have had about 800 people. By the 10th night of anointing, I had to move to Tiger Stadium, 12,000 people outside because the anointing just kept growing and people didn't want to miss a night. Oh, what night is he on? Night five? He announced on God TV he's going to have 10 nights of impartation and lay hands on everything that moves twice. We've got to get in a service. And it was manageable with 800. But when it got up to 10, 12,000, Last night I prayed, I prayed till four in the morning. I had a baseball. Tiger Stadium outside, four in the morning. I was going around praying for the last person. I went, man, I'll never do 10 nights of anointing again. <laughs> but each night, God would let me know just 24 hours. I could make an announcement on Thursday, tomorrow night, and that's it. And I, I asked the Lord about it. And I said, God, why can't you just tell me the whole weekend? of politically 20 years from now the word of the Lord for Timbuktu and it never gets personal for you you got to understand how personal a living God is and how he wants to break it down and care about your 24 hour cycle of life and bring Jesus after this weekend into every 24 hour cycle and then what you do in those 24 hours is you go, well, God, how many healings are we going to get? What if we get 20, 30 healings tonight? You know, because you break it all down into that day. And so it's been a blur for me the last six weeks trying to, you know, catch up with everything that's been happening. We just got out of Memphis, Tennessee. And Memphis was a street crusade. And I'm kind of redoing the idea of street crusades instead of like, Let's just have Saturday and give out hot dogs and hot chocolate. Call it evangelism. I love that. I, I do what we do, right? All kinds. But most of America's evangelism isn't like what I do overseas. 50,000 people, 100,000 people. I do big crusades overseas. Why? Is God different in America? Is he not the same? But we don't expect in America, and we don't build towards the goal in America, we just go to Africa. And then we wonder why there's no great harvest happening in Western nations because nobody wants to make the commitment because it is harder here. One, just because the crowds and we're the land of overabundance and the land of, especially since COVID, you know, post-COVID world, people don't even want to come to church anymore. They're like, is it online? Can I watch it on Facebook? We got spoiled, man. And it's great to have a day where anything anybody preaches, you can get for free. Well, I pay for it all the time, right? I got a book table back there. Make sure you buy all my stuff. But 80% of my stuff is digital now. I don't bring it on the table. So what you see there is just a small, you got to go on the website to get the rest. Because it's digital. Cars don't even have CD players anymore. Maybe yours does. I don't know. But most cars... They're not going to have a CD player in a couple of years. Why even come out with a new CD? It's like coming out with a record or a VHS. Who's going to play that? So the world is different, but America, God started speaking to me about four or five years ago to launch a harvest movement. I call it a movement because that's what we're building. It's not just having an evangelistic event for two days. We're building a movement. You know, Join the movement. Come change the world with us. And instead of just taking teams to Africa, India, Pakistan, 
all the countries were like, hey, we're going to be in Memphis. Hey, we're going to be in New Orleans. Hey, we're going to be in Las Vegas. Or hey, wherever we're doing it, right? We did one in L.A. We did one in the historic Bradner Stadium in New York. You know, and, you know, we're doing these outreaches called Revival Harvest America. And God really spoke to me in 2018 that it was time for Revival Harvest and Awakening in America, that we need to take the energy and the resources we are putting overseas and start really making an intentional effort about redoing evangelism in America. Because I'm a big, most evangelists, we like to have the crowds, right? You know, that's why they go overseas. Nobody wants to just preach to a couple hundred people when you can go overseas and have 50,000. Same money. Things cost a little more here, and you don't get the same bang. The newsletters don't look as good. You get it. So the Lord started to challenge me after 20 years of going overseas where I saw over 2 million saved, planted 4,000 churches, built orphanage, it had a huge, great international global missions ministry, inspired another hundred evangelists that are in ministry now full time because they watched what we did for 20 years, and now they're doing it. And then the Lord said, how about America? I went, I'm Canadian, eh? <laughs> People forget I'm Canadian. I got a tattoo to prove it. <laughs> so God had to send me here as a missionary 20 years ago to believe for revival in America. And man, when he started speaking to me five years ago, the last thing I wanted to do was crusades in America. Because I said, God, how are we even going to do that? Where am I going to rent a venue? We wouldn't even fill a stadium. Nobody would. So I, I, I said, where, where's the major evangelism in America right now? I mean, there's always a few. I love Mauro Murillo. You know, he's got California. It's rocking. A few other places. You know, there's, there's always a few. But in a nation this size, when you can count on one hand, how many evangelists we have rocking in a big way. And, of course, the ones we do have are all overseas. They go there. So I was like, Lord, you want me to do this mandate for revival and harvest and then he gave me this other idea after I did about four or five of them Wildwood, New Jersey, I did the boardwalk it was awesome, Wildwood, New Jersey has the ocean city and the boardwalk and we got to do the crusade right out there, set up had the big meeting and then the real action was out on the boardwalk all day long, it wasn't even the crusade at night, it was having the teams out on the streets, 100 evangelists out on the streets, you know, that's where the action is and so, you know, we did baptisms in the ocean. I was like, wow, it's not California ocean, but I'm going to do it in New Jersey. And I walked right out into the ocean, and I said, who wants to get baptized? I had a megaphone in my mouth, and I just preached from the beach in the ocean and then had a spontaneous water baptism right there in the ocean. You know, and so that was fun. So, you know, I've, I'm finding a way to take all the elements of what I love about outreach, because I'm about the teams, prophetic evangelism, power evangelism, getting outside of the four walls. I'm not just like, here's a hot dog. You know, I like to, to get out there and do street preaching and whatever. Acts of love and kindness are great too. So I thought, well, Lord, how do we do the crusade too? How do you do the money? How do you make it all work in America? And he said, well, here's what you need to really build a movement so that when you go into a city, no matter what city you go into, you bring a hundred with you. Like this whole room. We're going to Memphis. The whole room comes with me. Now I have a crowd with me. I'm not dependent upon the churches. Should I go into a place that doesn't have the setup or the local churches to work with? Sometimes the first one I ever did, we did uh, 44 churches worked with us on the East Coast. And all of them were churches of 50 to 100. I thought, Lord, you're using the mom and pop churches, 50 to 100. These are the churches that get passed over. And I put 44 of them together. And we rented the historic Bradner Stadium, made the front page news, Olean Times, mayor came out. I mean, it was awesome. And people were like, how did you do that? And I went, I started to visit for four to six months, just the small churches, 50 to 100. I would get them really excited about what God was doing on the grassroots. And then I would go to the next church two hours away. And then I pulled them all together. And they felt like they had purpose together. Kind of like how the tribes would go to war. 
but we got into this mega church kind of idea which has fallen apart and everything's always been about numbers and now everybody's like you know what I don't know that we're into that because we want family we want community we want connection so I started to go God if I could get 10, 20, 30, 50 small churches everywhere I go in a region that's 500 miles I could do anything anywhere and we'd have the resources, we'd have the volunteers, we'd have the workers. I mean, I went into Lakeland, Florida, no churches brought us. I just went in and rented a ballroom, had 250 people sign up. They came from everywhere across America. People were like, man, that's more than how many people in some of the small churches in Lakeland. And we had them all fly in from everywhere, even Oklahoma, to join us in Lakeland. And I thought, wow, from scratch, I could go anywhere and put on my own meeting. Now that, that opened my eyes to, man, we could do evangelism. I could, I could have a team of 50 to 100 join me on the streets. That's all I need. And so we started that. We just got out of Memphis literally two weeks ago. And it was awesome because they had 200,000 people. That's the next question. Well, how many people were at the crusade? 200,000. Now, you tell me anybody that has 200,000 at a meeting. Except for they weren't there for just me. The Lord gave me a strategy. He said, do your crusades. We were right downtown, 15th floor of the, the most prestigious hotel. In fact, where we were in the inner city in Memphis, Buell Street, B.B. King. We met B.B. King's nephew. I mean, we were just out there rocking and rolling. You know, Waller, old school wrestling is there, Memphis wrestling. We were all down there. It's also the murder capital of America. That's why you probably all didn't come. And, and so two people were shot on the street one block from where we were doing evangelism why we were there just murder right on the street why we were there we were like one block away and then they had like a, a group out there preaching hate and they were like a, I think they were like a Black Lives Matter or something and they were out there on the street preaching hate and they had all these mean thugged guys like 300 Bodyguards out there intimidating people, mean mug guys out on the street, and, and then their preacher was preaching hate. We were on the other side of the street preaching love. But I mean, then I got out of the city and there was another murder. Three murders. It's like, wow, thank you, God. But forget about all that. They had 200,000 people in for Memphis in May, which is a barbecue and music festival. So I set up our whole crusade downtown, rented the ballroom so I could preach every night. We were live on television. I did it in every home for Christ. And we had the gospel campaign going to individual households, three to five people in a household. They get a direct 15-minute video message from me right to their mailer. So every house had to hear me, even if they didn't come to the crusade. And I had a mini crusade, thousands online. And then I thought, wow. Now we're really thinking outside the box because now we reached over 4,000 salvations or souls online. And then we handed out another 4,000 invitations on the streets, 8,000 people. And so those people that didn't even come to the meeting got to go online, watch my little video message, and then ask for prayer. And so we can follow all that up. So I got another strategy on how we can make it even bigger so it's not just about the meeting, but how can you reach blocks? How can you reach the inner city? So our partners started adopting a household at 49 cents a house. That's what it cost me. Then we put the video mailer together and the whole thing, and we sent it direct to each mailbox so people had to see it. So they knew we were in the city. They knew why. And then they could watch my little video message right on their phone. QR code, link. It's perfect. And then they didn't even have to fight through the 200,000 people, come downtown where the murders were, and come to the meeting. But our teams, we had people from Montreal, St. Louis, Kentucky, Carolinas, all over America that don't even live in the city of Memphis. They want to see revival in their city. So they're serving other cities. Think about that for a minute. When the 12 tribes were called to go in and take the land, nobody got their inheritance until everybody came together to fight for each person's city. Imagine we started to think like that. 
if we could help that city get into revival, then when we're in revival, then we can call on the others. But we don't think like that in the kingdom. We're not kingdom-minded. We're me, myself, and my, my territory, my member, my... And I get that to a degree. But when it comes to outreach and evangelism, we've got to get outside the box because no one man's going to do it alone. So it was great to have these people. We had a witch guy. He was uh, in the city of Memphis 17 years ago. It was like a uh, witch doctor, warlock, and uh, methamphetamine, you know, drug dealer. Got saved in the church I was working with and then had to leave the cities for 17 years. He came back for the first time in 17 years to join Revival Harvest America, went back to his church that he got restored to, got out on the streets, and, and you know Daniel Emerson. And what was great was he was out there on the street with another guy that left Memphis that was a drug addict, and they both moved to Kentucky. <laughs> they came back to Memphis, and they're on the street, and they're talking to somebody, and, and a guy walks up to him and says, hey, I got some drugs. Pulls it out, and a drug deal's going down. He goes, you want some drugs? And my guy looks at him and says, I don't need any drugs. I used to be a drug dealer, but now I'm a hope dealer. Leads the guy to Jesus and the guy that was the drug runner that they would have a stash. And he'd run off and get the stash, bring it back, and the drug deal's going down all around my guys, and the drug dealer gets saved and can't sell drugs anymore because he met hope. <laughs> Come on, think about that. That just happened. Those are the kind of testimonies we're talking about. You can always talk about the numbers, the thousands, whatever. But you know why I like the Gospels? It breaks down the stories to one woman with the issue of blood. Sure, there were multitudes healed, but the stories in the Gospel are personal. So what? We have 300 healings. That doesn't mean anything. But how about this? Just a few weeks ago, a man that was paralyzed, his name was Steve. I knew him for 20 years. Steve was in New Jersey. I had my eight-year-old daughter. She turned eight years old, and she said, Hey, uh, Dad, for my birthday, can you take me on a trip? My first trip, just you and me together. I just turned eight. I want to go on the road. Help you do words of knowledge. Pray and prophesy. Because that's what she's used to. So I said, I'll bring you to New Jersey. So I bring my eight-year-old daughter to New Jersey. And uh, it's awesome because when we get there, it's just her and me in the hotel. And she already likes to wait on the Lord. We call it soaking. So she's like, Dad, we didn't do any soaking. I got our uh, prayer books out. So when we wait on the Lord and we get revelation, we can write it down in the book. I've been teaching her that since she was four. I have a prayer room in my house called the upper room. And I would go up there and pray. And she would start coming up every night for 30 minutes and lay on the floor with me and get revelation called it soaking in the secret place and so uh, if you know our ministry at all you know I teach on soaking in the secret place so she caught that so now we're out on the road and she's like so dad we're in the hotel when are we going to pray I said we're on 4 or 5 o'clock that's when I get revelation for the meeting at night so I'm teaching the 24 hour principle and it was amazing because she went to her mom and said, I want to go on the road. And uh, we're in the hotel. And, you know, kids like to swim. They like to swim in the pool that I call the fun stuff. And uh, I'm preaching between services, so I want to rest a little bit. And I'm laying down at 2, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And she's just got a, a, a gift for her 8-year-old, you know, birthday where she can write and color. She likes to paint and stuff. And she's just coloring in her book. Well, I guess Jesus appeared to her started talking to her while I'm in the bed and she's having a conversation with Jesus and here's how it went so there's going to be a guy downstairs on crutches and he broke his leg and you're going to pray for him in the lobby of the hotel and he's going to get healed so I want you to get ready to tell your dad that when you go down to the lobby of the hotel he's going to have to be ready to pray for a guy that's on crutches that has a cast and a broken leg She's thinking this. She's coloring in her book. She draws the seven spirits of God, seven colors, after she gets this word. I went, so, hey, we going to the pool? She said, yep, forgot all about the word, right? Now we're going to the pool, 3.30, 4 o'clock. 
I got to get back up the price. So I was like, we're going to go for an hour. We get down out of the elevator, and there's this guy sitting out there in the lobby of the Westin Hotel. You know what a Westin Hotel is? Really nice hotel. Restaurant, people all over the lobby, and you got to go through the lobby to get to the pool. I'm in my swim trunks. She's in her bathing suit. We're going to the pool, not being spiritual at all. And as we get to the pool, she goes, oh, Dad, I forgot. Did you see that guy sitting out there? And I went, what guy? She goes, there's a guy out there with the cast on, with crutches. And I went, oh, no. She's going to want me to go out and do something. I got nothing on it. <laughs> like, you know. I love to pray for the sick, but I usually like to have a little unction first if they're not coming to my meeting where the atmosphere is already there, you know. So I'm going to the pool. She goes, I forgot, Dad, when you were laying down in the room, Jesus told me that we were going to lay hands on this guy and he was going to get healed. So we need to go back. So we go back through the hotel and we walk up to this guy. And my, my daughter, I said, hey, this is what happened. Can we pray for you? And he must be thinking, whoa, your eight-year-old daughter and you're in the hotel room and Jesus tells her this guy downstairs with a broken leg. <laughs> and, you know, and, he, and he acts like he's totally cool. He's like, oh, yeah, no problem. You know, yeah, pray for me. He didn't even know how to receive prayer. We laid hands on him and he got healed. Instantly healed. Felt heat go through his cast. His toes started moving. I said, I can't believe my eight-year-old daughter just showed me up. Now, isn't that the way it should be with your children? That the kingdom belongs to the children? So I remember my other daughter, four years old, one time we were driving to a revival meeting and I heard this noise in the car. What are you doing, four years old? So I just started speaking in tongues. See, we're talking about the kingdom. This is the Heating and Kingdom Tour, right? This is where we need to break it down and make it real and practical. It doesn't always have to be this crazy, like, you got the video, the ambulance. We jump in the back of the ambulance. The guy had been brought to the meeting in a coma. He had already been brain dead. They said, you can't, we can't do anything anymore. We're unplugging him. He's dead. So I don't know if you get any more dead than that. Hospital said, you need to take him out of the, you know, the family went in and said, well, we're not. And they took him out by ambulance. And the reason they took him out by ambulance is they heard that there was this meeting in the middle of nowhere in India and that I was there, the only white guy, besides my assistant, Lewis. And I got tattoos, so I don't even call myself white. I call myself colored. <laughs> Whenever I preach anywhere, I'm colored. South Africa, I go, I'm colored like you, I'm colored. <laughs> so we're there, and I had this meeting with like 10,000 people. And, and, and over this whole time in India, you, it's illegal now. Hindus are in power and, and they will arrest you if you're a foreign minister coming to India to do big crusades. Because I used to do big crusades, half a million people. So did Benny Hinn. He had a million people. Joyce Myers. My office was next to Joyce Myers in Hyderabad, India. I got a lot of history, 25 years. So the laws changed back 2018, 17. And now they put out a, a a warning that no big American preachers can come over to India and bring money and do crusades. So you got to go in and kind of be like, I'm visiting. And then you have to have a church bring you in and you have to preach inside a church building. Because if they catch you outside, they'll just arrest you. So I didn't realize how bad it was until I got there and I had a wanted poster at the airport in Bombay. And I was all over the country. They were looking for Todd Bentley. So anyways, I had every night, 24 hours, I had one meeting in one city for 24 hours, 10,000 people in a meeting. Then I would have to leave by the next morning and go to the next city so they couldn't catch me. And I did that for two weeks. We get to this one meeting, it's like a Tuesday night, and there's 10,000 people. And I'll never forget the meeting because a guy that was born totally mentally insane. When I say insane, think you're an Indian insane. 
This guy was like out of his mind, heard voices, talking to people all the time. Schizophrenia, bipolar, all of it. He, he couldn't get 10 feet next to me on the stage. I said, come here, come here, come here. And it was like electricity would hit him. And he'd jolt back on the stage. And the ushers couldn't get him either. And then he started manifesting demons. And all the demons came out of him just by this electricity. Nobody had to lay hands on him. Came into his right mind. Then there was like nine deaf mutes healed. Never heard from birth. That's Book of Acts. Thousand salvations. Pack it up. Let's go home. As I'm leaving the meeting, they call me, Mr. Bentley. And there's a riot now. People outside that couldn't get in. The whole town knows I'm there. I had to leave at night under the cover of darkness. Couldn't even wait for the next day. Had to hide out for two days. They were going to come and arrest us because of this miracle. Because it's illegal to do notable miracles. And so they were going to arrest me because I was doing miracles. So as I get out of this meeting at 11 o'clock at night, whatever time it was, there's an ambulance outside. Mr. Bentley, you've got to come over here. We've got one more person. This guy's dead. He's no brain activity. They unplugged him. The woman's like, it's my father. And so we barely had 10 minutes. And I had to jump into the ambulance just to be able to lay hands on this guy. And then I had to jump out of the ambulance. And this guy sits up right in his ambulance bed. He's totally in shock. He didn't even know he was gone. Neither would you if all of a sudden after six weeks and you didn't even know you were brain dead and now you're like, hey, where am I? And who's this tattooed guy laying hands on me? He had to take it all in. So we spent 14 days in India, saw over 10,000 salvations and saw like 70 deaf mutes. I lost count. Blind eyes, all kinds of miracles. All in the last few years. Now, what was amazing about that, that was India. I preached in another one of my churches in India. I have a 60,000-member church in India. They meet in six wedding halls in Hyderabad, biggest church. I gave them a prophetic word in 2017 that they're going to plant 200 satellite churches. He goes, what's a satellite church? I go, you got a 60,000-member church? You don't know what a satellite church is? Satellite churches are like overflow church. I told them what it were. So I came back in 2019, and he said, I brought you back, man of God, because you're the first person that's ever given me a prophecy that came to pass. We have 231 satellite churches. And at the back of his church, he had a whole a laptop with the live stream for every church, 231 laptops. His church is 60,000, so he's got the whole 231 people manning each laptop. I said, how big are these overflow churches? He goes, we rent a hall between 1,000 and 3,000 and fill it. For a satellite church. He goes, we even planted one in Dubai in the Middle East. None of these churches existed until you came and gave us the prophetic word. You're a true apostle. And I went, well, thank you. What did you do to make it happen? He goes, we believed the word, and then we started to go after it because we heard you say it. I wonder how many prophetic words we're sitting on where we think the prophet was wrong, but we did nothing. We heard the word, we believed the word, and we moved towards making it happen because we believed it was a word. I bet you some of you right now, there's a word of wisdom. Some of those words you've been sitting on, they're waiting for you. I got a word about going to Africa. Well, get your passport and figure out who's going to Africa and get on a team and make it happen rather than waiting another 20 years. It's like when God told me when he tells me anything, I just go out and do it. Hey, do a heating meeting in that city. Well, no churches are inviting me. That's okay. Rent a ballroom. Make it happen. You either believe it's not sovereign if God uses the gifts and talents that he gave you to walk in obedience to what the word is. Same with the Bible. If you just sat around and waited for the Bible to fulfill itself, how many of the promises in the Bible would... I put the prophetic rainbow word on the level of the Logos word, if it's a true word. 
you should know if it's a true word. And it's okay to test it out too because this is where the sovereignty of God will protect you. Well, I don't want to miss God. Most, Paul was going to go to Macedonia or Rome and the Spirit of God didn't permit him. He was already on the journey. Remember that? And then he said, well, where did we go? I don't know. Change directions. Spirit of God showed up a second time and said, hey, you're not supposed to go over there either. Then he had, I call it the Macedonian principle. Then he had the dream and the man showed up and said, come to Macedonia. Then Paul went to Macedonia and had a great move of God. You got to trust that the father, I never live my life stressing out about thinking I'm missing God. Because God is good enough to correct me should I be moving in the wrong direction. So in the meantime, if you're not getting any Macedonian dreams, then do something with what you already got and just preach the gospel. Watch what will happen. So I was talking about Memphis, right? And I'm talking about my daughter in New Jersey. We get to the meeting. We share that testimony. That night, a guy named Steve paralyzed 51 years since 1971. I've known him for 20 years. I've prayed for him 20 times. I gave up believing for his healing. We just accept that he's the paralyzed guy. Couldn't even lift his arms. Was in a coma. So uh, he comes up to get prayer Friday night. Nothing happens. He's soaking in the presence of God. Loves the Lord. Then at the end of the meeting, another group of people pray for him. Maybe my daughter. They wanted to blast him again. We're at the back of the meeting. Service is over. And all of a sudden, this guy screams out at the top of his lungs and starts running to the back of the building. Arms in the air. I'm healed. I'm at 51 years paralyzed healed. That's another one of the 300 miracles. Hello. So we've been seeing like uh, blind eyes, deaf ears, tumors, cancers, like an increase of miracles since we stepped back into the healing well in Lakeland. Just like Asbury, this was love and holiness and sovereign. Boy, that was refreshing. Let me just say that again. Sovereign. What if what the Father wants to do in Oklahoma is just sovereign, has nothing to do with anything the church has done? Does God behold, does he hold the right to do something sovereign even when we mess up? Every time in my life in 25 years of preaching the gospel that I've needed to be rescued in some way or another from my own mess, you know how God did it? Sent me another revival. Every time, his answer for when I'm done and burned out and thrown in the towel, here we go again. God will come along and just sovereignly go, here, I'm going to give you a gift. You know what the gift is? Me. It's not about us. Doesn't mean we don't do the stuff that we're supposed to be doing in Oklahoma, but I have a sense that God's going to bring a sovereign move to Oklahoma not based on us taking credit for how much praying we did how much fasting we did we got the churches in unity that were divided because sometimes I look at a lot of places and I'm like man revival's a long way off in America so I want to encourage you with this start praying for something that's totally sovereign that just shows up that you didn't even know was coming because the father gets all the glory that way He'll use people in it. But I'm believing for sovereign revival. I've seen enough revivals in 25 years of preaching that almost every one of them, I never knew they were coming until they were there. And I said, God, you didn't even tell me until the day I was in Lakeland. Then the angel showed up and told me, oh, hey, I'm the winds of change. You're going to have a revival. That was the day of the revival. You couldn't have told me a month before so I could have prepared? 
He goes, no, you would have messed it up. So I'm really walking in a level of grace and the abiding rest of God right now that nobody can take me out of. I don't have time for all the naysayers. I don't have time for the religious spirit. I don't have time for politics. I don't have time for anything other than staying in the grace of God and staying in the abiding rest of God. And hopefully I'm a little more mature today at 47 than I was in my past. But I've never had the peace that I have now. No striving. I've done a lot of striving in the years, especially in my younger years. Young, zealous, and full of vinegar. You know, and when God's using you to cast out demons and do all the great stuff, it's easy to get a big head. When you're 25 years old and God's using you all over the world, we've had 37 resurrections from the dead. Try to put your teeth in that. And the majority of them have been in the last 15 years. So that ambulance coma guy was like a guy from the dead. Two years before that, I was in Pakistan, the Islamic Republic of Pakistan. Three people raised from the dead. There's a video of that. Nine-year-old boy raised from the dead. Another man raised from the dead. Three people raised from the dead in one meeting. So, of course, I had to go back. Revival. 405,000 Muslims saved. I didn't do any work. You know why 405,000 Muslims were saved? Because three people were raised from the dead. And that was the one thing in the Islamic Republic of Pakistan. He's a teacher. He's a prophet. He's a, we don't believe in the resurrection. So if you can prove to us the resurrection, we'll believe. So I met with about 20 of the major inums or enums for all of Pakistan in a private meeting. They wouldn't even meet with the Secretary of State from America, but they met with me. They said, we're hearing about all the miracles, all the healing. Tell us something. We got one problem with Christianity. The whole resurrection and Jesus being God. And I went, Jesus said he's the resurrection and the life. I'm a false prophet if God doesn't raise the dead. That night, I didn't know. They all showed up at the meeting. They wanted to make sure I was preaching the stuff. So they all showed up. That night, three dead people got raised from the dead in front of all those witnesses. Couldn't have seen that coming. So I went to India. The church were 60,000. And they heard about Pakistan. So I was preaching in the middle of the sermon. And there's this usher coming down the aisle. And the ushers, they got a carpet rolled up. And I'm thinking they want me to get done preaching so they can renovate the church at the end of the night. And they bring this carpet down. They just throw it on the ground. Flump. I didn't think about it. It's prayer time. Praying for everybody. Pastor comes up to me. Hey, can we roll out the carpet? Mom's in there. I said, there's a dead body in it. We'd get arrested. So they said, if Jesus just raised three people in Pakistan from the dead, why is he not going to do it here? So we did the best we could, and we prayed, and nothing happened. Meeting gets done. They got a hospitality room. But it's downstairs. And so they know I want to go there because there's like 50,000 people. I want to get out. They want to get prayer. I want to get out. So they go, well, man of God, we're going to send you down there by yourself for a minute. We'll just walk you down there. They walk me down to the hospitality room. They open the door. And they let me in there and nobody else comes in. They shut the door. And it's just me in there with the tea and the biscuits and the juice and a dead body. <laughs> they thought if they sent me in there by myself and just kept everyone away, shut the door, I could have a quiet time and pray. They didn't even tell me there was a body.
Guess what? Nothing happened. That same church was hosting me for 14 days, one night in every city, 10,000 a meeting. And how they had to do the meetings were, we have a special guest speaker tomorrow night. Meet us Tuesday night. That was it. Wednesday night, we have a special guest speaker. Meet us. Thursday night, we have a special guest speaker. They didn't even say who was coming. Nameless, faceless. I said, well, how's anybody going to show up? Well, we told them there's a special speaker coming. They're so hungry for God here, 10,000 will show up. Without a flyer and my beard and the whole deal, as great as that beard is, I said, you've never even told them I was coming? I used to be on God TV. I had a half a million. I'm big in India. You would have big crowds. And he goes, that's why we didn't say anything. They're already looking for you. I thought, this is awesome. I go, well, when do the people find out I'm here? He goes, after worship when I introduced you as the guest speaker. You can't even pop your head out into the meeting until the worship's over. I went, I've never done this, man. And he goes, and you'll see the crowds will be there, and then when then they see you, they'll be excited. So I walk out, and the whole crowd, oh, it's Todd Bentley. You know, it's like, praise God, you're all here, and you came for Jesus, not Todd Bentley. That was a great lesson there. Because sometimes we get so concerned about things that the Lord's not concerned about. And it was awesome because for 14 days, there was no rock stars. People tend to think because I look like an old rock star that I am the one that pushes for the rock star. No, I'm not. I just get stuck in the whatever churches and ministries or God TV or whoever I'm working with, and that's how they all work. If you knew me, you would know I'm the most probably just chill, hangout, normal dude. But everybody else in the world, the ministry, makes me things that I'm not. Kind of does that to a lot of people, especially if you have any big ministry or TV or success. All of a sudden, you're a target, Benny Hinn. You're just a Todd Bentley. I don't know why. I'm just a target. Doesn't mean I haven't made my mistakes in the past, but I'm also a way bigger target. I can't even just show up and do stuff without people talking about it. I, I love to live off the radar. You have no idea how refreshing that was to be in India and know that nobody was there for Todd Bentley. They were there for Jesus. That was awesome. So, anyways, they got their resurrection of the dead with the guy in 38. I'm not keeping track, but that's a lot of resurrections. And to me, that's just normal. Shouldn't it be that way? Like every ministry? And, and by the way, that's not me laying hands on 37. I mean, I might have laid hands on eight or nine myself. The ones in Pakistan were amazing. They happened right before my eyes. You can watch the video on YouTube. There's over a million views of the Pakistan dead raising video. I remember the boy they brought up. I shared this at Jim and Tina's church. And, and I went to pray for him and nothing happened. And the mom and dad and they're wailing and there's 250,000 people and I'm looking like a false prophet and they're carrying their dead limp son. He stopped breathing and it, paramedics checked him. He's dead. Don't get any more dead than dead. You know, it's amazing when you share a story about the dead getting raised. The first response you get in America, only in America, by the way, not India, not anywhere else you go in the world, just America. Well, how do you know he was dead? I don't even want to answer such stupidity. But let me tell you how I know he was dead. The paramedics at the bottom of the stairs before you can come up on the stage had to verify that he was dead because they weren't going to let him come up and get prayer if he was still alive. They were going to put him in the ambulance and take him to the hospital. You, you see what I'm saying? The craziest thing about preaching in India, and I didn't know this because nobody tipped me off. All right, this was actually Pakistan, sorry. The craziest thing about preaching in Pakistan is as I'm preaching, ambulances are coming with their lights on and pulling into the crowd of 250,000 people, and I'm thinking people are dropping, having strokes in the crowd, people are getting hurt, and I'm thinking, well, not a good healing meeting to have ambulances showing up. You know, in America, when an ambulance shows up at a church, that means somebody didn't get healed, and they have to come haul them out of the service. So I'm thinking, there's seven ambulances. They just keep coming. And I went, is there a riot out there or something? I'm preaching. And finally, 
I asked the pastor, I said, hey, what's with all the ambulances? He goes, oh, they heard about the miracles and they're going to the hospitals and bringing them from the emergency room to your meeting and you're now the emergency room. Every night, every night, 35 ambulances over five days, seven a night. I was like, 35 ambulances? They're coming to my meetings. So this nine-year-old boy, and uh, he died, and they brought him to the stage. They said, the preacher said he could pray for the dead. And the father's holding his dead limp son, and mom is there, and weeping and wailing, and everybody's watching. And as I go to pray for him and nothing happens, I'm thinking, man, that's a bummer. I don't even know about the two other bodies yet. I said, God, this is the last miracle, 11 o'clock at night on the last night. You could undo the whole meeting here. Then the Spirit of God whispers to me. Remember that 30-day revival in California? And you ignored this old woman that walked up to you and gave you a piece of paper in 2017? Here I am in Pakistan thinking this Fresno, California. It's just an 80-year-old woman, piece of paper. And then it's, she said this to me. I'll never forget this. She goes, you're about to go to Pakistan and have your biggest revival. Within six weeks, by the way, a million people were saved. She goes, you're about to have your biggest revival. And I went, they kicked me out of Pakistan in 2016, wouldn't even let me in. So you know I went back, but, so I was thinking, I'm not going back, you missed it, it's a year old. She says, and a sign, because you're not a believer, she rebukes me. A nine-year-old boy will be raised from the dead, and that's when you'll know it's real. So now fast forward four or five months, I'm in the Islamic Republic of Pakistan and I'm praying for a nine-year-old boy and he didn't get healed. And then it dawns on me by the Spirit of God. This is the nine-year-old boy. Goosebumps went through my body. This is a William Branham. If you knew the prophet William Branham, I said, I got a word. And the Lord said one more thing. Slap him in the face three times. I felt like Elisha or Elijah, you know. That's what they would do. I'm like, man, now I got to be a real prophet. And I looked at the father and the mother. I'd go to jail, by the way. Ceremonial unclean. I'm Christian, they're Muslim, dead body. You know, there's some rules over there. It's like the woman with the issue of blood. You don't touch her. There's rules. I don't know what the rules are. But I'm sure this is against the rules. Slap him in the face three times. He's dead. His father's holding the body. The mother's there weeping. How insensitive can it be that this tattooed bearded evangelist is all of a sudden going to put his arm back and take three good whops off of your face and hit your dead son on the stage? What if he wasn't raised from the dead? having a Smith Wigglesworth moment I said God I'm going to have to take this body and kick him across the platform or throw him up against the wall three times like Smith Wigglesworth did because this boy is getting raised from the dead sure enough on the third slap boom his eyeballs vibrated I saw it and his eyeballs rolled back in his head and then his head snapped back boom and then he was raised from the dead for 45 minutes 250,000 people went bananas. Tap, 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 tap. Todd, there's another dead body on the stage. What do you mean another dead body? Yeah, they heard about this guy. 45 minutes later, they went and grabbed another guy from the village that died today, earlier. Well, I said, well, he's not four days, so he's still good. This is the video on Pakistan, Todd Bentley, dead brazen, you'll, you'll see it. One of the students from Bethel with Bill Johnson were with me on the trip. Bill Johnson had some of his students join me and he gets out his phone and he goes, I don't wanna be insensitive, but I'm gonna film this one. 
and we walk over and you see me climb over this guy's dead body and I hammer him in the three times he's dead I'm like you're gonna come alive and she's there boom he gets resurrected from the dead right on the stage in front of everybody looked like a zombie <laughs> he didn't even know what happened widow make her heart attack rise from the dead as that was going on for 45 minutes they got on the stage because they didn't want to fight the 20,000 at the stairs they walked up to the stairs and just rolled the dead body tap 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 there's another body on the stage. We all turned and looked. I got the video of it. And you see his dead body sprawled out on the stage. As soon as we all turned to walk across the stage, the glory went across the stage and resurrected him from the dead. Nobody laid hands on him. I felt like tonight was a testimony night. And I called the, the message heating of the kingdom because I really felt like tonight God wanted to set the atmosphere for us praying for miracles tonight and healing tonight and I love the kingdom it's kind of my favorite message the kingdom of God is not in word only but power and many years ago the Lord told me to stop preaching the kingdom unless I was going to bring the demonstration before the message so it was kind of different because every other preacher would bring their 45 minute sermon and then demonstration and the Lord said too many people are preaching the kingdom without demonstration when the kingdom means demonstration you can't be talking about the kingdom of God and it's not just mere talking it's power it's my favorite 1 Corinthians 4.20 it's the best 4.20 we're in Oklahoma The kingdom of God is power. And I thought to myself, what are the signs of the kingdom? You know, miracles, signs, wonders. Luke eleven twenty. 20, if I cast out demons by the finger of God, the kingdom of God has come upon you. What's another sign of the kingdom? You must be born again. So how do you know the kingdom of God is at hand, right? We say the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's what Jesus' first declaration was in Mark 1. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. From that day forward, he demonstrated it. He preached the gospel of the kingdom and healed. But somehow we've gotten the healing out and the casting out demons out, and we have a bunch of preachers now in America every Sunday preaching. And, they're, and I don't even know that they're preaching the gospel of the kingdom. They're preaching maybe salvation, or they might be preaching parts of the kingdom, but definitely not the kingdom message. Jesus didn't preach the gospel of deliverance. He didn't preach the gospel of prosperity. He didn't preach the gospel of salvation. He preached the gospel of the kingdom. You need to ask what that is, because we always go, are you preaching the gospel? If you're preaching the gospel, you're still missing something, because you're not called to preach the gospel. You're called to preach the gospel of the kingdom. And what is the kingdom of God? If I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, the kingdom of God has come. Jesus declared the kingdom was at hand, and then in the next sentence, he was healing every sickness and every disease. Why? Because you can't have and preach the kingdom without healing and demonstration. So when you're talking about the kingdom of heaven is within you, how much more should we be seeing miracle signs and wonders? You know why we don't? Here's why the church isn't seeing more miracles. You want to know why? Yeah, it can be the anointing. Yeah, I can give you 10 reasons. But here's the number one reason we're not seeing more miracles. We're not being intentional and we leave no time for the miracles. If you preach an hour... You better pray for the sick for an hour. I'm tired of messages. You fill it up with the worship, the offering, the announcement, and the sermon, and then we go home. And the altar call is like an afterthought. So I started to go overseas to Africa, and the Lord said, don't even preach on the first night until you demonstrate so that they believe what you're saying. Wouldn't it be amazing in America if we brought the demonstration of the kingdom and we saw hundreds of miracle signs and wonders and the blind saw and the deaf heard and the cancers were healed and then we preached the kingdom people might actually go man this guy might know something about the kingdom we need a revival of the demonstration of the gospel of salvation healing 
deliverance. I'm glad the deliverance ministry is coming to the forefront again because we've got a lot of demons. We tried to convince ourselves we have none and we might have more than anyone else that believes in demons because we're just hiding ours and putting a suit on them. Well, Christians can't have demons, so therefore they're done with demons. And we're all messed up. Anxiety, depression, anger, life help, psychology, take another pill. We got so many demons, I'm telling you right now. I go to Africa, they don't have the options to get the medical and the pill and the psychologist and all the stuff that we can. Not that I'm putting any of that stuff down, but over there, it's either you get delivered or you live with your depression and anxiety and panic attacks and suicide because you can't get treatment in the bush in Africa. So they've got to get healed. That's why they're desperate. I love science, but it's also done us an injustice. We go, what does the science say? My first thing is, well, well, I'll tell you what the science says after I tell you what faith says. Faith is above science. Think about this for a moment. Faith is the only substance that will draw the divine. So if you want to see heaven or the kingdom or anything of the supernatural world show up in your world in the 24-hour cycle, the only thing that will bring the divine is faith. Not science, not anything else. Not that God doesn't use science. And I'm all about that. I go to the doctor too. Because you see, I'm just impatient. And I'm not against doctors. But it's amazing when I look at the demographics of other countries and what they have and what we have. And then I go, man, we've convinced ourselves in America that we don't even have demons anymore. Well, Todd, are you saying we can be possessed? No, and that should be a given because you know you have the Holy Spirit and you can't have a demon living inside of you. So that's not what I'm saying. So if you like the word demonized, we'll use that word. If you like the word oppressed, we'll use that word. And I don't even try to theologically explain it to people, but I'm like, man, if we started treating things like Jesus did in Acts 10, 38, anointed with the Holy Ghost and power, what did he do? Went about doing good. What's good look like? Healing all those oppressed of the devil. So was there anything that Jesus did in the Bible that wasn't an oppression of the devil? No. So if he healed the blind, that must have been an oppression of the devil. How do I, I want to say it this way? For this purpose was the Son of God manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil. So everything that Jesus did was to destroy the devil's work. So when he healed every sickness and every disease, I wonder what statement that was. It's the devil's work. It doesn't mean you have a demon. I look at things in America. I'm not happy with the government, the politics, and all the stuff. But, you know, Joe Biden, thank God, doesn't live in my backyard. See, we tend to think the demon's got to be right here in me to affect you. Satan's the god of this world. It's a fallen world. It's his playground. He doesn't even have to be near your house for you to be affected by the devil's policies. See, we just got to think differently. We are engaged in a spiritual battle more than ever, and we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. So I'm glad God's highlighting the deliverance ministry because for about 20 years, we lost it. And by the way, it's going to come out with funny business, it's going to have its excesses. It's going to, just like anything else, when it gets restored back to the church, everyone's going to judge it. Because all of a sudden, movie theaters are packing out with deliverance. I know the guys that did the Come Out in Jesus' Name movie. You know, Greg Locke. I went to his revival in Nashville. You know, met him again in Asbury. I know those guys. Alexander Pagani, all the deliverance guys. I watched his ministry go from a little storefront to worldwide international. Now he's in Argentina, all over the world, Bob Larson, everybody. And I'm like, you know, on the show with Bob Larson. I was like, really? That's a whole different deal. But I'm thinking, man, it's amazing in the last few years how God's decided to get the church ready to advance again by giving us back all our spiritual weapons. I've been in healing ministry for 25 years, and a lot of people are doing healing today that weren't doing it 20 years ago. Thank God for that. We always got to give a little pat on the back to the church. Come on, give the Lord a mighty shout that we're advanced today in the supernatural compared to 20 years ago. Because I'm telling you, 20 years ago, you couldn't even say open heavens and supernatural. People would just freak out. I was a part of that move. I helped bring in that move 25 years ago reality of the supernatural and now stuff I talked about 25 years ago gates doors angels it was just it's accepted more now 
Maybe when Bill Johnson and I started preaching on the suit, it wasn't accepted back then. So everything takes its time. But we have to give the church a little compliment. It's not all negative. America isn't all negative. God is raising up his remnant. And that's why this weekend, not only tonight, is going to be focused on praying for healing. Saturday night, why don't we do impartation? Tomorrow night. Get everybody carrying an, an activation for this next season in your ministry of whatever that gift might look like. I mean, I can pray healing. I can pray evangelism. I can pray revival. I can only pray what I carry. But guess who carries more than all of us? Holy Spirit. So when we have anointing services, he will show up with what you need, even if I don't carry it, because the Holy Spirit is the fullness of God. So we're going to do that tomorrow night. But tonight, we're going to pray for some miracles in a few minutes here. How many came tonight expecting a miracle? See? See what I'm saying? That's why I don't need to fill up a whole other hour preaching a sermon, because I thought, man, we just got to get people ready for the miracles. You know, I haven't been in Oklahoma and. I told Pastor Joel in the car, flew in yesterday, I said, it was 2014. I think it was the first time I ever came to Oklahoma. It didn't start in Oklahoma City. I was actually in Tulsa. And uh, I went for three days to Tulsa and had a revival breakout in 2014 in the city. I think it was Edmond. So across the city, 30 minutes or whatever. And there was a couple of churches I was working with that were sharing a building together. And I'll never forget pastor's wife's name was Canada. Canada. And so um, they said, come on down here. And we did a 14-day revival called uh, Revival Ignited, Oklahoma City. Was anybody a part of that nine years ago? Anybody heard of that? Oh, one, two. Okay, we got a new crowd. So uh, I spent two and a half weeks in the city here. And then I went to Wichita. Did two and a half weeks in Wichita. Revival Ignited. And then we went to Europe and did two months in Europe, Paris, Germany, all over Europe. Same revival started right here in Oklahoma, Tulsa. And then we ran that revival for three months. So it's been about nine years. And uh, was it last year or two years ago I came down to Ringling? Does anybody even know Ringling? You're all from Oklahoma. Who's heard of Ringling? Just, just, because when they invited me to Ringling, I was like, is there a place called Ringling? What, what, who's going to know that? How are my partners from Texas, Albuquerque, and all over America? Because they're texting me. What's Ringling? We know Oklahoma City, but what's Ringling? I was like, I don't know, but there's no restaurants. There's no hotels. I stay in a house, which is nice, by the way. But that's it. So it's just revival and the move of God unless you want to drive 45 minutes to try to find anything. And I hate driving more than 10 minutes. I have a 10-minute rule. I don't like driving more than 10 minutes. 13 minutes to the church. That was okay. When you travel as much as I do and you fly, last thing you want to do is spend an hour going to the church, an hour home at night, then another hour to go eat dinner in the middle of the day, and then your whole day is shot. So I'm like 10 minutes. Uh, it was last year, right? 21. Wow, where did the years go? I met Pastor Joel one night. I think you guys came down. Did anybody come down to the meetings in Ringling? Okay, a few. Because I'm going to be there again after this. Is it Wednesday? Come up here for a second, Jim. Tell me, you were in Lakeland. What, did, what was your experience in Lakeland? And tell us a couple of testimonies and then tell them about Ringling. <laughs> when I went to Lakeland, I really didn't know what to expect. I've seen Todd time and time again in ministry before. But when we got there, I have never seen, I want to call it like an open portal for miracles. It was like rapid fire, just one miracle after the other, after the other, after the other. No laying on of hands. People were just getting up. Blind eyes open from birth. People with deaf ears. There was a young man there that the umbilical cord was wrapped around his neck at birth, and he only had like 60% lung capacity. And he carried a piece of equipment with him to test his breathing. He had to keep it with him. He was standing behind as a catcher and got healed. As a, as a catcher, we had 98% capacity and back to his lungs. He had never had that before. It was miracle after miracle after miracle. Yeah. We, and I went there. I had eye surgery a few years, about two or three years ago, and they d damaged the muscle in my eye, and I was having double vision. I looked left or right and just double vision. Out in the crowd, I come up. God healed me. No more double vision. 
Uh, in fact, I told you I tried to make it come back. It wouldn't come back. No double vision. Haven't had it since. She now lets me drive. I mean, <laughs> but there was just miracle after miracle. So I came here tonight expecting to see the same thing because I know we will. We've had miracles in Ringling when he was there. We had a guy that had metal in his neck, screws, couldn't look, couldn't look up. He hadn't since he was a teenager. He couldn't look up, never seen the ceiling. The metal disappeared from his neck. He was totally healed, bones replaced, and now he looks up. You know, I mean, God has just done miracle after miracle. Oh, Ringling. Ringling. Uh, the 8th through the 11th. Come to Ringling, Oklahoma. It'll be a new experience for you. So that's in a few days. So I'm believing this weekend, if you know anybody that needs a miracle, we're going to be here Saturday. We're going to be here Sunday, 2 o'clock. That means we just have a lot of time to go right into Sunday evening. We don't have to be in a hurry. And I want to pray for everybody tonight. And sometimes I'll do like words of knowledge and call out eight or ten people and pray for a few people and hear the Lord and do it that way. But today I just felt like the Lord was saying, let's have some prayer lines and pray for everybody. And I believe we're just going to see a whole roll of miracles like that. So you don't have to go tonight unless you get prayer for your healing. Tomorrow will be an entirely different service. Impartation. But we will pray for healing Saturday and Sunday. So if you know somebody that's not here tonight, they didn't miss out. Because I don't want anybody to show up this weekend without getting prayer. Even if I don't get a word of knowledge. I think tomorrow night I'll have some more prophetic ministry and words of knowledge and be an entirely different service. Before we do all that, I want to do uh, our offering tonight. It's going to be a faith offering because you've yet to receive. So I want to, uh, where's the envelopes? They should be on all the chairs, especially in the front row. Pastors and leaders need more envelopes than anybody. <laughs> So we have an envelope. Grab one on the chair. Give me one minute. No two-hour offering. You're either going to give a faith seed because you're expecting to receive. Faith pulls on the divine. It's one thing to give an offering after you get healed. I mean, I pay for my dinner too when I go to the restaurant after I eat. And guess what else I do? If it was good service, I give a tip. But that's not the way the kingdom works. The kingdom moves by faith first. So I want you to sow a seed because it's good ground. And, you know, we're blessed to have the churches put up for the hotel and put up for the air, uh, the airfare and split together. And so thank you for that, Jesus. Usually I have to pay my own way. If I want to show up and preach anywhere, I usually pay my airfare, my food, my hotel, and my staff before I even take an offering. Because a lot of the smaller churches, they're like, we want you to come. You could take offerings, but we can't afford a hotel. We can't even afford your airfare. So when you're working with churches that are smaller, most of them in today's world, they want you, but they can't afford the expenses of bringing you an assistant. So I just decided years ago, I work by faith. I'll take the offering, and I'll pay my own way. I don't know if you know many evangelists that do that, because usually they charge you five grand to even show up. Not me. I don't have a set amount. I work by faith. I like to tell people how I work because I'm up front. All the offerings go to the, our organization, Revival Harvest Ministries. That's how I do Memphis. How do you think I do missions? You know, it costs $50,000. This is why a lot of people don't do the things that we do on the streets because they just don't want to put that kind of money. But we want to see souls, and we want to see heart. So I want you to pray about it because we're rebuilding now for our next revival crusade in Pittsburgh. You got lots of time to prepare about the second biggest city in America that's called the murder capital. In fact, I was in Pittsburgh earlier, and they said, we beat Memphis. They're number four now. We're number three. And then there's Southside Chicago and a few other cities. So I'm going to Pittsburgh and the church I met in Pittsburgh is in the inner city. Beautiful church like this. You go outside, 40 houses are all boarded up. They're all crack houses. There's nobody within three blocks of the church because they ran it into the ground with death, murder, and crack. 
So now the government can't even do anything in those three blocks. So they basically gave the church to the pastor for taxes. And then they said, hey, we got this property out front, 100 acres. We'll never fill it because every house is boarded up and we have to tear down all the houses and start over again. That house on the corner is the only house and he killed five people and he's still in there selling crack. Two blocks down. Police can't touch him. I don't know why. Inner city. It's the hood. And so I'm like preaching there inside. It's like this. Outside, it's chaos. You can't even do evangelism there because there's nobody there. So the city goes, we're going to give you the 100 acres for free. You can put a tent up. You can do anything you want. We're going to give you another building next door for a drug rehab. And so this church is literally, for 10 cents on the dollar, bought their church building, bought a rehab home, bought, like, and they're buying it all up, and they're going to renovate it for the gospel. So I was there preaching, and they said, hey, why don't you come and preach in Pittsburgh? We need you to bring the Revival Harvest America crusade and outreach. We already have the tent and you could do your first tent crusade. And we'll set it up, it'll cost you nothing. So all I need is 100 evangelists. That'll be in September. We're doing the Every Home for Christ. 49 cents a home. How many homes can you do? Let's start tonight. Oklahoma could be the first city of generosity. So fill in this if you haven't already. You'll notice there's a way to give. I think there's a PayPal, Cash App. And uh, you can write a check if you still write checks. We do have debit, credit, just about any card you want to fill in. Please write your name and address so we can get you a tax receipt. You will get one. All of these offerings go 100% into the work of the ministry. People go, well, does Todd get paid? If there's money. I haven't drawn a salary in months. So I also live by faith. The only time I get blessed is Sunday morning. That's an honorarium for me and my family. That's how I live. So Sunday mornings, the church will take an honorarium. That'll be separate. Just so you know, on Sunday, yeah, it's a chance to bless our family because we got to eat too. Because I raise all the money for the, the gospel and the crusade. So I didn't notice we have the beautiful up here as well. You can use the Cash App. You can use the PayPal. There's even a QR code if you want to just take your phone and just zap that QR code. Not only will the link for giving come up right on your phone, but how to get on our email list and you get free teaching every week, free podcast every week. You can just sign up right there on the QR code. So just go ahead and grab your phone if it's smart and just use the QR code and it, sh it should pop right up on your phone. And there'll be three or four links. A lot of people like that for giving because now you don't even have to fill in an envelope. You can just do it right on your phone. It's very secure. Great way to give $10,000. It's all secure. Okay. Anyways, we just, Lord, we thank you for this offering. People are preparing, praying about their faith seed. And God, we're sowing into revival. We're sowing into harvest. We're sowing into miracles. We thank you, God, for the open heaven in Oklahoma. We thank you for the supernatural breakthrough for Revival Harvest America, what's coming. And we thank you, Lord, for the miracles that are going to happen tonight. The healing that's going to happen tonight at the altar. God, I feel great faith, great energy. Let, amen. Ushers going to take that? Do we have ushers? If you're watching online, use the links online, YouTube, wherever. You can come forward. Or are we going to pass those? What are those? Those are buckets. I like those. What are they? No excuses. I literally walked in and I went, Pastor Jim, what's the name of the church? You know, because it just kind of came together. You know, Pastor Jim and Tina reached out and said, hey, you guys want to have Todd? He's coming down. And uh, so I was like, he goes, it's called, it's everywhere. <laughs> I was like, wow, I, I kind of like that. No excuses. No excuses. I'm saving my strength, guys. I haven't eaten. I'm, you know, fasting. So that's why I'm sitting down a little more, because i got to pray for 100 people. So I'm conserving my strength. I'm filling up on waters and Gatorades. I, I wasn't fasting in Memphis a couple weeks ago. I got food poisoning. That was terrible. I missed two nights of my own crusade. Sick. I had two other preachers. That was the first time in 25 years. Don't get food poisoning. 
By the way, I hate not eating. Because you guys got Whataburger down here. <laughs> Last time I had a good Whataburger was yesterday. So don't get the idea I've been fasting long. I'm a short, like, fast a day, fast two, three days, get her done, and then eat. And I used to tell all of my favorite fasting friends, Mike Bickle and all these, Lou Engle, oh, man, I get the kind of breakthrough after a day of fasting that you guys get after 40 days. They're always amazed. They go, Todd fasts for three days and raises the dead, and heaven comes down, launches a revival, and we, and we like, do five 40-day fasts a year. And I went, I don't know, man. I could fast a day and get, get a breakthrough. <laughs> I think the Lord just knows me. But I had a Whataburger when I was here two years ago, and I'll, I'll never forget that Whataburger. We had to drive, like, hours to get it. It was so satisfying. And they broke the 10-minute rule. Driving from Ringling to the Oklahoma City Airport was more than 10 minutes. So we got the offering in. Praise God. Thank you for giving online. Wow, that camera's way up there in the air. Praise God. Is it because I'm sitting down that you had to go higher? You've been there all night. Looking good. If you're watching in the area, come on, get in your car and get down here and get some this weekend. We know who you are. Trust me, nobody's going to bite you here. Well, maybe a demon or two. I got some product here. Let me throw this out. Who likes free stuff? Probably get in trouble. I almost sold out tonight already. <laughs> Haven't even got the ringling yet. I called my wife. Got to send more product. They're hungrier than we thought. So you do want to take advantage of this tonight because I will sell out. I got my number one teaching school on how to develop your seer gift, how you can see in the invisible realm. And this is key if you want to get revelation all the time, 24 hours. This is what I do when I'm soaking or when I'm praying for a meeting. I go to get the blueprints and the patterns from heaven for that day. And I teach on how to get accurate, detailed words of knowledge, names, dates, addresses, how it works. And I also teach on spiritual gates, doors, and portals. What is your spiritual eye, where it is, and how to get it open, and it's not the third eye. See how the devil always tries to steal and make out a mess of what God's doing? We don't need a third eye. We have spiritual eyes. And they're very different, by the way. Having your third eye open is not the same as having your spiritual eyes open. So it's about a 10-hour equipping school. Who'd like to have it? Well, any birthdays in here? Can I throw it out? You ready? Heads up. If somebody gets an eye out. I was in a meeting, and a guy threw a CD out, not me. Hit the guy's eye, and it popped out. <laughs> Hanging down his cheek. I think he got the CD. We had to pray for him. He got healed. Just like Peter cut off that guy's ear. I was like, man, I could have used that anointing when I was a kid. Because I took somebody's eye out with a stump stick wars and took their eyeball right out but I didn't know how to pray for the sick back then so he never got his eyeball back okay I got a couple books this is my number one selling book right now on prayer and intimacy okay we've been talking about miracles and signs wonders and casting out demons revival this is the book that started it all it took me 20 years to write it it is my testimony, but it is also all of my teaching on prayer, intimacy, soaking, stillness, waiting on the Lord. So Bill Johnson wrote the foreword from Bethel and uh, 
how to experience the intimacy with God you've always wanted. So how many need a little revival in their prayer life? Yeah, that young guy, I'm going to give it to you. You were screaming and jumping up and down for the first product. Will you guys share it? Are you brothers? Yeah, they're my sons. Well, there you go. It's going to the household. You see how they work that? Dad gets up, mom gets up, sons get up, extended family get up. Somebody's getting it in that family. <laughs> Last book I'm going to give away. You can check it out after you get prayer. The Kingdom. I've got two books on the kingdom, so I kind of do love to preach on kingdom theology. And so how you can make the kingdom real in your life every day in the Westin Hotel, wherever you're at, miracles, signs, and wonders should become normal. And so for me, I've, I've lived the lifestyle of it's normal. You know, one of my biggest criticisms and judgments in 25 years of ministry is I've seen too many miracles. <laughs> really, that's what a preacher said to me one time. He goes, you got to be hyping it up. You, 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 it cannot be this much. And I went, well, you can go all over the world and investigate if you want to. But I said, imagine that our mind is so skeptical sometimes that we can't even believe that when the kingdom is showing up, that it is showing up the way that it's showing up. I mean, 73 countries, you know, we've seen a lot of stuff. It's not all in America. It's been around the world. But I'll tell you, I was in Lakeland. We had 85,000 testimonies filled out. 30,000 hippo, where I had to have the medical hippo act. And I went on Geraldo Night and Nightline News and all this secular media back in 2008 because the secular media was coming to our meetings. That's when you know you're having a move of God when the secular media shows up because they are all like, why are 10,000 people a night showing up at this tattooed evangelist guy's meeting in Lakeland? Didn't even look like a preacher. And so Oprah Winfrey, you know, I mean, everybody. And it was the only time in 25 years of preaching that all the secular news, BBC news, all the news, and of course that didn't help. And, you know, I was pretty young and dumb back then, so I was like challenging the media and, you know, you know wished I did things different. But we had 85,000 prepared testimonies for the news. Of course, they never showcased any of that. They always showcase the ones that don't get healed. Of course, there's going to be people that don't get healed. You can come to any meeting we do and focus on the ones that aren't healed. Or, like when Lisa Ling, you ever heard of the reporter Lisa Ling? She worked with Oprah Winfrey, a lot of television networks. She came to a meeting I did with Rick Joyner at Morningstar in 2010. And we had about 800 people for a healing school. So she was following around the whole, anybody that got healed. Deaf ear, that was awesome. You know, some real miracles. And then she chose to follow this one kid that was born handicapped in a wheelchair, drooling out of his mouth, and he didn't get healed. And they made that the story, and, you know, uh, didn't bother me. But what was crazy is Lisa Ling was with me, right next to me at the altar. Oprah Winfrey's girl for the own Oprah Winfrey Network. Was, and they sent her out to do a show on me called Our America. I was on Our America. And so Lisa Ling, the reporter, was right next to me. And a, a, a person deaf from birth that never heard, never spoke. Lisa Ling's in tears, jumping up and down, never seen America. They didn't put that in the show. Just to give you an idea of just the way that there's a, a bend on all mainstream media. They, they are told the report. It's not news if it's just good news. It can never just be good news all the time. It has to be negative. It's the news. That's what they do. I turn on the news to hear about what's going on in the world, not all the happy things. Because usually you turn on the news, you hear the crime, the death, the murder. That's what news is. So they weren't going to put Lisa Ling and the miracles. They were going to focus on the four or five that weren't healed. And that's just the way it goes. But the kingdom is a reality that we can all get moving in. Who'd like to have the kingdom that doesn't have this? Oh, just who's really hungry? I can't hear you back there. All right, there's a lot of people there. Now, I don't know if I can interpret. How about the very back this time? Somebody grab this for me and take it to the very back. Somebody back there by the door, because they always get missed out back there. Yeah, there's a, there's a guy with 
I think he's got a beard. He sat down real fast. He's like, no, that ain't a beard. This is four inches cut. This isn't even a beard. God bless you. So I got a book table somewhere. Here's what we're going to do tonight. I need to move out a couple rows of chairs to make a little extra room. At least the first two rows. I don't want to mess up the whole place. But I need a little room because it seems like a lot of people want prayer. So we're going to clear out the first couple aisles. Uh, did these chairs move or are they locked? You won't be able to keep up with me tomorrow. I'll have all my energy back. Yeah, no Whataburger tonight. I'm not breaking a fast on a Whataburger. Oh, hi. How you doing? Nice to meet you. I haven't met you before. God bless you. God bless you. I'm sure he's told you all the bad stories. We've known each other a long time. 20 years, Pastor James. Pastor Dave. How many pastors do we have here? Any visiting pastors here? God bless you. Anybody else? Pastor visiting? Preachers? God bless you. Met, met a few of you already. My good friend James South is here and his wife. I'm going to pray for them. I met him with R.W. Schombach. Now that's a famous evangelist. James South over here used to be an assistant and travel with R.W. Schombach. He was one of the first guys to bring me down to Daystar Television with R.W. Schombach, and then I went to the camp meeting. And that was a rollover. Everybody had white hair, and they didn't know what to do with me when I walked in. <laughs> but yeah, R.W. Schombach, what a great preacher. He preached for me in Montreal, Canada. I had a crusade, and I had him preach for me in Montreal and a few other places, but... That's how far back, Pastor James. You guys moved back here then from Carolina. You were in the Carolinas. That's right. You move around all the time. I can't keep up. But you've always been an Oklahoma boy. So, praise God. Now, why are you guys all so far away from me over there? So, I'm going to pray for people that need prayer. Let's get the worst cases up front. Crutches, canes, dying. You know, if you're here and you, you've got cancer or you can't stand long, you know, you know who you are, you got mom with you, somebody that can't stand, let's get them down front here, my assistant Josh Patat, say hey Josh, you'll see him at the book table, you'll see him running around the sound, he makes things happen, let's have a prayer line shoulder to shoulder, we're going to do it, Jim and Tina, you helped me a lot in the meetings in Lakeland, you can help me out here, we're going to line everyone, anybody else have a major condition, or are they all minor conditions, anybody got anything terminal? incurable meaning if you don't get healed you got to do meds the rest of your life okay why don't you come up here right now and let's believe for the hard cases first deaf ears blind eyes come on up kidney failure and then anybody else that needs prayer for healing go ahead and come on up we're going to do a second line after this first line we'll do a second line Come forward. We're going to have a prayer line. These are your healing lines. So I want you to come forward. If you come forward now, and I pray for everybody, I don't want strong. So that's why you don't get to sit in your seat. You got to get up and come down to the anointing. You got to get in the action. Because here's what you'll notice. When we start moving down these prayer lines, you'll feel it building as we go. And it might be stronger at the end of the line while I'm over here. So if you're in that second line... You're going to get the inertia overflow. Praise God. So come on up here. I'm going to give them one more minute to get everyone organized. If you do not get in a prayer line now and you do not get prayer tonight, that's your fault. Amen, amen, amen. Glory, glory, glory. So there's got to be good steak down here, right? You guys still got meat? I didn't know if, if it, everything's running out in the country, you know. Is this meat cost twice as much? Or did you keep it the same in Oklahoma? Where I'm at, meat that was $14, like $40. I was like, well, maybe it's the same in Oklahoma and I'll have to kill me a cow and bring it home. 
Praise God. We're all ready? Okay, let's just close our eyes for a moment. Lord, I thank you for the anointing tonight. Whew. Jesus, we thank you for miracles through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. We thank you for instant miracles. We thank you for healing. We thank you for supernatural recovery. We thank you for deliverance. As we lay hands and release the anointing tonight, that the anointing breaks the yoke and removes the burden. Father, release your power. You can feel the holiness of God coming down. Just wait on that for a minute. Just go ahead and pray on your own. Just get yourself ready. I don't want you to think about anyone else around you. When I step into the prayer line, I'm going to... So if you've got cancer, that's all I need to hear, cancer. I don't need any of the backstories. Because here's what will happen. If I need the backstory, the Holy Spirit will give it to me by word of knowledge. And then it's better. So, you know, because I'll tell you, but there's no special prayers that I have for conditions. I tell people this, here's the key to healing. Ready? It's the same healing anointing. The same anointing for healing cancer raises the dead. The same anointing for healing arthritis in the knee. It's the same anointing. We think there's a prayer for blindness, a prayer for deafness. And that doesn't mean we can't get specific. But I tell you, if we just get focused on receiving the resurrection power and letting that touch you, and all I need is that point of contact with what's your condition, what's your condition, what's your condition. If you don't tell me anything, I'm just going to bam and move on. Tomorrow we'll have testimonies. Sunday we'll have testimonies because I expect a lot of testimonies will start coming in. Let's get people here tomorrow night that you know that are really dying. Call them up. FaceTime them. Get on Facebook. They've got that thing called social media. I've, I've yet to see every person in a meeting that has Facebook post something. Imagine if 100 people that are on Facebook all went home tonight and posted something, how quickly it would go out to the whole city. I'm sure one or two will, but my challenge is, if you got a social media account, post the flyer. Tell them to come Saturday and Sunday. That's how quickly we can blow this thing out the door. A lot of people didn't even know what's going on, and they need to get healed. Now, here's a word of knowledge coming to me right now. Somebody here has got a... Uh, like ulcers and like growths and build up in the stomach more than one ulcer and I don't know if you got a tumor or a growth in there. is that you at the end okay. is there bleeding ulcers no, it's a mysterious lump in my stomach. lumps come here Father, we command healing right now. Oh, there goes the anointing. Now, who's got a bleeding? Bleeding in the stomach. It could also be from stones, kidney stones. Come here. Hold my hand. Right there. Father, we just release healing right now. Command those stones to be healed. Okay, get back in the line. Because I'll pray for you for the other stuff. Do you feel anything since I spoke the word? Fire, burning, heat. It's already on you. I saw it come on her. You have a problem in your ankle? Power is going all the way to your ankle. Is that correct?
months. Keep seeking the Lord. Who's got a brain lesion? Brain lesion? Concussion? Left a mark on the brain? Come here. Man, I'm heating up now. What's wrong with the brain? Genetic disorder that comes with the family. I had bleeding blood vessels in the brain, not like an aneurysm. It's called a hemangioma. The Lord healed me, but my daughter in Chicago, they found one in her brain and behind her eye. Can you feel that tingling and that heat? I think the angel touched me and I was sitting over there on about the second word. Wow, I'm hot now. Sometimes you'll feel fire, burning, heat, electricity. Not always. Sometimes the pain will just disappear. I always get like a tingling of my left hand. And I wasn't going to do any words. I was just going to go and pray for everybody. But then they just started coming. And they come real fast. That's what I mean by I don't have to get it all at 4 or 5 o'clock. You have to be open to God to start moving in the meeting. I love that. Spontaneous. Okay, 28 years. 28 years. But I don't take meds. Well, put your hand in your heart. Yeah, because I feel a tightness. Diabetes. Can you feel the tightness always or when you came up here? When I came up here just now. Just now it manifested. It means it's going to come out. Mm-hmm. Whenever somebody stands before me and the condition gets worse and it wasn't that way before they came out, that's not a coincidence. She's getting close to the anointing. That's why I'm heating up right now. You see how I just instantly sweated? You see that? I'm sweating too. Yeah, look at that. Instant. Probably a demon of oppression I'm going to cast out of you. I got a bump on my knee I can't get rid of. Get rid of. It's a cyst. I'm going to swack it with my Bible, but I thought I'd blow Okay, go. Here we go. Close your eyes. Say, thank you, Jesus, for healing me, delivering me, and my daughter. I thank you tonight for the anointing that breaks through and then heals and delivers in the name of Jesus. And I command the spirit of infirmity, go from your body. And Lord, let it go all the way through her legs. I felt the tingling go through my neck right there. Breathe. Breathe in. The breath of God. We deliver you from high blood pressure 28 years. We deliver you right now from the spirit of infirmity. We deliver you of the condition in your brain and your daughter in Chicago in the name of Jesus Christ. I just got a bolt of energy, my man. I'm ready to go for a run. Bam, that's the anointing. We still in the line? Man, my energy just shot up 10 times. Fast must be over. Time to eat. I only ever fast till I get the breakthrough. Lord, this new heart, and not only this new heart, I've got to command the damage that's been done in his body from repetitive issues with the heart, the blood, the brain, these attacks on this young preacher. And it's time to see a full restoration because he's going to preach again. And he's going to move in the mantle of miracles, signs, and wonders because that's who he is. Whew. And Job's latter days greatly increase, saith the Lord. So even as it was with Job and Hezekiah, even as it was with Caleb, as strong at 85 as he was at 45. I command a divine reversal of the damage that's been done these recent years. I see divine reversal. I see arteries unclogging themselves. Like even blood vessels that are unclogging themselves. Any kind of clots 
I see a flow of bloodstream happening in your body. Circulation to the toes. And God, I pray that he would have a brand new heart that would shock the doctors. You know what's amazing is not only do I preach miracles, but a lot of people don't know this. So I was 29 years old and I died. Came out of my body in the bush in Africa. I died of a heart attack. It's all verified. Angel appeared to me in the bush in northern Uganda after I died. Famous evangelist that I was mentoring at the time named Jeremy Nelson. He was with me. He was my intern. He said, God, I command my spiritual father to come back into his body. I came right out of my body. And an angel came right down into the hospital room and touched me. Said, you can go home and be Jack Coe at 38. Because of my health, I was 300 pounds. He said, or you can make a decision to make changes in your life. And I said, yes, and he touched me. They put me in the hospital in Uganda for three days, Kampala. We ran all the tests. They said, man, you don't even have high blood pressure or cholesterol. You haven't even had a heart attack and died. You don't even have issues of any of the warning signs. I said, that's impossible. Go to my doctor in Canada, and he will tell you that I was pre-diabetic, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, 285 pounds at 28 years old, and he said, you're not going to make it. Then I died, and was under stress and a spiritual warfare. A witch doctor cursed me, and I went back to my hotel and, and just dropped dead of a clinical heart attack. EKG was off the charts, hundreds. I couldn't even keep track of all the numbers. They got the paper and everything. So uh, they sent me to the hospital for three days to run all the tests. They said, man, you're a perfect specimen of health. I flew back to Canada, and the doctor said, hey, I know your tests. I got them right here. Hey, I go, I don't trust what they did in Africa. Put me back in the hospital in Canada. Put stress tests on me, made me run all the machines. Did every test possible. And he said, this is impossible. What happened to you? I said, doctor, I've been telling you about Jesus. I came out of my body. My spirit man sat up, and I looked at my own dead body on the gurney. And a white light appeared. And as it got closer, the light opened up into a full tunnel. And then I saw this angel, and my first thought, because I was talking to him and the guy in the room my spiritual associate Jeremy he heard me talking to him and I said what are you doing here and he was like who's here Todd and I couldn't hear him and I'm having a conversation with this angel I said I know you I pointed I said I know you you've been showing up in my meetings you're the healing angel you showed up December the 5th, 2000, after I got that William Branham, John G. Lake impartation with Bob Dylan. I said, I know you. I'm having this conversation. He goes, yeah, but I'm not here for a healing meeting. I'm here to take you home. I said, I want to go home. He said, well, God's going to give you a choice then, but you're going to have to make some lifestyle changes. I'm 165 pounds now, but then, and get a load of this. I'm saying this because God's about to do miracles of divine reversal on people that think you can't reverse years of the worst medical charts. From years of abuse on alcohol and, and substance abuses, I had stage four liver failure. So bad that even in 2017, that wasn't from problems then, but years before, they said it's gotten to the point now where we have to put you on a donor list, you need a new liver. I didn't tell anybody. I'm in the healing ministry. And here I hadn't drank in years, and now they're telling me my liver is stage four. And, and it's so bad, I'm probably going to have my liver shut down, and I need a, a donor right away. I said, this is terrible. I just did a three-month revival because that could have contributed to it because I was preaching too much, not resting enough. And so I said, well, I'm going to go get healed. I went out of the meeting went to another meeting and I had everyone pray for me guess what happened I went back and they said you have a baby teenage liver it's pink <laughs> this is not the liver you had where did you get this liver my doctor was just blown away so not only do I preach and see miracles I have been the recipient legally blind 85% one eye I don't need the glasses for that but 85% legally blind then they said this other eye was 
They said, you, you'll soon need a handicap sticker for the blind and you won't be able to drive. By the time you're 47 years old, you'll be totally blind, legally blind. You have a disease in your eyes called Stargardt's. You had it since you were born. You didn't even find out until you were 44 years old. And within five years, you're going to be blind. Try to take that in. I'm not going to see my kids' faces, my wife's face. They said, if anything, you'll be able to watch TV through the corner of your eyes sideways. And, they, and he said, like, immaculate degeneration? He goes, no, no, this is worse. This is the only one that doesn't have a cure for it. And it's a genetic disease. You were born with it. It's not your fault. And it was just hitting in your genes. And then it has, like, a code. And then it just kicks in one day. So it just happened to kick in when I was doing a conference called how to develop your seer gift. I'm at the eye doctor that day because I went blind. And the doctor said, you're legally blind and you can get a handicap sticker. We got it. Your whole life's going to change. I had to show up at the conference with that diagnosis and do the first session called how to open your spiritual eyes. Father's Day. Seven months later, I'm in a car driving to Father's Day church service. And the power of God falls in the car and my blind eye pop, pops open. <laughs> totally healed. I've had three medical tests now. And I said, the disease hasn't it just stopped dead in its track. We don't know what happened. I said, I know. I preach miracles and I'm a miracle man. That's for you. You're a miracle man. My pastor friend here, I've known him for 15, 20 years. I told you I met him with R.W. Schombach. He was his assistant. He introduced us. He said, how many strokes now? Two, six strokes. Two heart attacks. Scheduled for, bypass, scheduled for bypass surgery in three weeks on the 22nd. So you think I was just sharing a story. I was ministering to him. That's why I sat down next to him, and I felt like I just needed to build his faith up a little bit. Because just one touch from that angel... And let me tell you something. I don't just preach this stuff. It is real. It is. And it's one thing to tell people that need healing it's real, but it's another thing to go, I'm, I've been raised from the dead. I got a new liver. Hey, I got healed of blindness. So I go, healing is real. Nobody can ever tell me it's not real. I think that's why the Lord's allowed me to get healed so many times. And this man here is a miracle man. You don't travel with R.W. Schombach. You guys know who that man was? Jane's been hanging out around our ministry at different points, but six strokes, two heart attacks, all in the recent last few years. It's his Job season. He just moved back to Oklahoma. Got married. Your hand right now. And, and declare that tonight would be the beginning of divine reversal and a miracle and that the cloths would stop and the root would stop and the strokes would stop and the heart attacks would stop and that his miracle ministry would return. And, and listen, the thing that's going to keep you going is d keep dreaming about you being back in what the Lord's called you to because that's the thing you need right now. You need hope. You need hope. And the only hope you have is held to you in the beginning. Stand. It doesn't change because of a few challenges. And Lord, we thank you for the Caleb anointing. We thank you for the Hezekiah anointing. And we thank you for full restoration in his body. Especially in your neck. I don't know why, but something's unblocking in your neck. <sighs> in fact, somebody else in here, a woman, has a blockage in her neck. Could be a thyroid or an inflamed uh, goiter or something, creating a block in your neck. Who is that? Right when I released that anointing, somebody's, as soon as I released that anointing, I heard the Lord say, somebody's shoulder on the left is just loosing right now. Whatever the pain, who, has anybody had a problem in their left shoulder? Start moving it. Start moving it. You should start feeling a tingling all the way to the base of your neck. Now I'm going to still pray for everybody. If you need a second prayer, just get in this line. Mr. Schaefer. Why does it seem like a famous name that I've heard before? You've been on TV or something? Did you sing? Preach? Preach? On TV? All over the world? How can I pray for you tonight? How can I pray for you? I have um, an incurable, been diagnosed with an incurable lung disease. I have a, a heart that's been messed up pretty bad. A 
I love the screws because the first miracle I ever saw with metal was about 12 screws, but it was also several plates and two rods. Two rods and several plates and 12 screws. And I was preaching in a place called Pensacola, Florida, Brownsville, where they had the revival. It was near the end of the revival. So they brought me in. I think it was 95 or something. And I'm thinking, this place is stuffy. It's supposed to be the Pensacola, Florida Revival. And it was stuffy for me. I'm used to Toronto, Canada. Toronto, John and Carol, or it was a different kind of revival. So they didn't like that I came in. I didn't even have a suit on. So that kind of just messed everything up. And people judged me because I walked in. Everyone was dressed to the nines in a suit and tie. It was just a different revival. And I walked in all tattooed. And, and back in the Pensacola church, I sit you up on the stage. So the pastor was like, I've got to get you a jacket. You don't look good sitting up here. And so anyways, I'll never forget that. So the crowd was hard, man. They were judging me from the beginning. And I said, God, I need a miracle. I don't even know how to get this thing moving. So I had everyone stand up, 2,000 people, it was a big meeting. I said, well, how do I pray for the first miracle? I've got to show these people something. And so I just said, well, here, here we go. God, give me a word. And I'm waiting. And he goes, there's somebody in here with metal plates, pins, and screws. I went, oh, man, we have to start with that? That's a big one. So I said, there's a woman in here. I got a little more specific. You got rods, pins, plates, and I called out how many surgeries she had on her back. Nobody moved. The crowd was quiet. Waited and waited and waited. And then all of a sudden, there was a little commotion. What's happening? Ushers are over there. And this woman's coming down, and she's walking like Gumby. You know the character Gumby? And she and I was like, and it doesn't fit in this crowd. She's totally like bending over and grab her, you know, she's gonna fly off the ground or something. Long story short, she had never been able to even bend over because of the rods. They were fused. So she's bending over. She said, my back is on fire. And all the metal melted out. Went and got the x-ray. All the plates were gone. All the screws were gone. Two were metal. Went dissolve in the bodies. Bam. And all the chambers of the heart would stay strong to the end of days. I so believe in the Caleb anointing, I'm already booking a crusade for when I'm 80. I know Caleb was 85, but I figured if I had something on the schedule for when I was 80, I would live that long. <laughs> Think about that. My mom died because she was 47, had a stroke, and gave up. She had no purpose to live for. Where my people have no vision, they perish. If you can't see yourself doing something at 90 now, you might not make it to 90. You hear what I'm saying? I'm only in my 40s. But I got to think that far ahead because I want to be alive at 90. So purpose keeps you going. My wife's trying to make me have another baby. She goes, I'm going to keep you alive. You can't die now. You got babies to feed. I got five babies. I don't need any more babies. What was your healing? healing <sighs> give them new discs stay under that anointing who where's my line He's right here, face him. Right here. yeah we just keep that line why here condition Okay. You feel the overflow? You see that? He's getting touched by the overflow from this guy's anointing. I saw that. Usually God does multiple groups of healing. He didn't just show up and heal one arthritis. He'll heal all the arthritis. That's another key to healing. 
Once you get one miracle, go after everyone in the room that has the same condition. All you need is one. And then everyone else with the same condition gets healed. Because the anointing is enough. Why would God heal, show up and heal your spine and then leave everyone else's spine a mess? But most of us don't understand duplicate miracles. So once an anointing shows up, I'll work that anointing for a little bit. So if anybody else has bulging discs, this would be a good time to put your hand up and go, God, man, my discs are getting healed tonight. Because God's not a God of partiality. You see, he's going, boom, I'm healing bulging discs. Boom, I'm healing bulging discs right now. I know you need more than that, but let's start with that. And Lord, we command every place of infirmity and suffering in his body and his heart and his lungs. Breathe in strength. Freedom from pain. Chronic pain. Somebody in this room's getting free from chronic pain. Years of pain. Oh, it's you. <laughs> I'm touching him like somebody in this room getting healed of chronic pain and I'm like my hands on him see how that works I'm gone I've got ten surgeries I've got screws and rocks see God doesn't call it out either that's not just prophetic guessing my hands on him I'm like hey, I'm praying for the bulging disc and I'm like somebody's getting delivered in this room of chronic pain He didn't even get a chance to tell me his other conditions. Because maybe the Lord didn't want him to because he wanted to show how he can just show up. So anybody that's got chronic pain, believe God right now, you're going to have no chronic pain. Come on, claim your healing. <sighs> now, do you feel fire, heat? Tell me what you feel. A tingle. Uh, what chronic pain? It's better. How better? Scale of 1 to 10. Four or five better. Four or five better. So almost half. Yes, sir. Okay, everybody stretch with your hand. We're going to pray for this guy again. Here you are. They're all releasing the anointing. I got a pain on my left kidney. Who is that? You. You just need a little more faith boost for this. Just showed up on my command healing right there. Just move your body now. What are you noticing? I, I feel better. It started down there. And oh, so it started coming. Yeah. And I was here See? I was here to catch my wife with her most severe allergies I've ever been around on a doctor's. I haven't even prayed for it yet. And, and so it started healing me. Great. Well, stay next to her because when, when the anointing, i got to come back over here. My lines are looking pretty messed up. What am I praying for? I've been diagnosed with schizophrenia since uh, like 2003 and had various injuries. I was super, I was extremely addicted to energy drinks. I mean, it would, they take those energy drinks. <laughs> Mine was cocaine. It wasn't energy drinks, you know, back in the day. <sighs> Lord, deliver his brain. I think a lot of your voices are from the roots of addiction in your past. Okay. So, Lord, I command the root of addiction, the cycles and patterns from the past Broken. to have no hold on him today and his future. Yes, Jesus. And some of the lingering, I want to call them injuries, that you picked up right. were from those times that aren't even who you are anymore. Right. So I command those things in your body physically to repair themselves now. Tomorrow night's going to be fun. What am I praying for?
feel anything right now? You were. Okay, I'll tell you what. <sighs> Be delivered. I found her cheese. Choo! Who over here needs a total knee replacement? Stand here for a second. Is there any pain? Yes. Hard to move? Yes. Mm. There's the anointing. Mm. Oh. Feel that? I don't even have to lay hands on her. <laughs> See? You know how I knew if I sat down she would get healed? I saw in a vision. That's why I walked over here. Said, who's got the net? <laughs> it's free, right? It popped. <laughs> Needed a total knee replacement. <laughs> you, know what, you know why it popped? I call it a cling-on. Sometimes demons like to just cling-on. And then the Lord goes, I'm going to hit you with joy. Boom! And everything else has to let go. Now come a little closer to me. You might have to push her in. Whew. I command both your knees, ligaments, tendons, and nerves all the way to your hip. I don't know why you're hip here, but I speak to your pelvic all to your toes. Season of joy. Who's trying to have a baby? Somebody knows somebody. <laughs> hey, who's trying to have a baby? Son-in-law, daughter-in-law. Look who's sitting next to me. Followed me all the way. And then I get a word for his son-in-law, daughter-in-law. Daughter? Stretch forth your hand right now. He's a doctor. When he has a miracle, you tell him the man of God was sitting next to you after he called out two of your other conditions, and you sat down next to me, and I got this one. Barrenness shall be healed. Bless them physically, spiritually, and emotionally, and open the womb. Watch how quickly. Watch out if you don't want to have a baby, because when I release that... I was in a meeting with a woman that was 48 years old, full hysterectomy. And I gave a word. And the power of God hit her and all the parts came back in and she had a baby. That was when I got commissioned to the healing ministry. The first time the healing angel came to me, that meeting, the woman was healed. That's how strong the healing anointing was. And then I went to New York and I gave a word with 200 people. I said, Barrenness is here. Eight people came down. New beginnings. All women that were barren. I laid hands on them. They all gave birth in August, the same month, all eight. Eight month, eight. The, I'm telling you, you can't make this stuff up. It's called signs and wonders. Where's my line? <laughs> what is it? Telling you the healing anointing has been increasing. You better get people here tomorrow on Sunday because once I'm gone, I'm gone. If they were within an hour drive or even Dallas, you better go. I was in a meeting Friday night. I think you guys should come up here. It might take a phone call, not just a Facebook. But I'm serious, guys. People will get healed if you get them in this atmosphere and you let me minister to them. Because I'm that convinced that God's doing something right now. Not every miracle's instant. Sometimes. You know, as they went, they were cleansed. Yeah, why are you here? So the doctor handed me a diagnosis yesterday. That I got a yesterday? Yeah. What did the doctor say? A cyst on the size of a golf ball in my brain. He's got a diagnosis here? He's got a golf ball sized cyst on the brain yesterday diagnosed. I love this stuff because then when these miracles happen, we go back to the doctors and we go, hey, doctor, what happened to that? 
golf ball sized cyst you told me I had right here. Okay, stretch forth your hands. Bam, golf ball sized cyst shrink. Golf ball size growth shrink in Jesus' name. It doesn't take long because I'm under a gift right now. I passed out three weeks ago and injured my knee and my big toe. You feel anything standing here? Lord, I pray today. I command this knee and woo. I almost got knocked over. Bam! There's the anointing. Got another word of knowledge. Somebody's had a slight from teenage years curvature of the spine, but now it's developed into like a full blown like arthritis of the spine. It's many years later now, you're not a teenager, but who's got arthritis of the spine? When it gets down to the tailbone, the lower part gets a little worse. Come here. Come here. That, you? Come here. Come here, come here. Just stand in front of me again. <sighs> the anointing is really heavy, so not having my energy and then the heavy anointing just kind of knocks me out for a second, so I just sit down and do it that way. Conserve my energy. Pray for everybody. Now, God, I command her spine to straighten out. <sighs> do you have pain in them when you came in? All over, all the time. What are you feeling right now? Any heat? Any electricity? Any. Something's trying to hold you back. Put your hand on her forehead, Josh. Command the spirit of infirmity to leave. There it goes. You see, I saw that demon. That was what it was. Listen, when I'm under this anointing, I see, I know you. Demons can't hide from me. Yep. So she wasn't being healed because that demon was holding on. So I saw it, and then I was like, well, Josh cast it out. He needs something to do. Now, anybody else got a problem in their back? It doesn't mean it's a demon, but just go ahead and put your hand on your back and go, God, thank you for my spine. Whew. Okay, hold on. You don't have to come up for this. I feel a pain. I don't always feel the words and alls either. It's rare that I feel them. But something just came into my right side. Almost like at the top. But it could be linked to a prostate problem. But the pain also gets in on, on the top and also the side. It just comes in. So I'm not sure if it's an enlarged or swollen prostate. It's definitely not a prostate cancer. So yes, it's for a man. And you don't have to come up, but you do get this pain. And it could be even like an infection that gets in, into your bladder or into your whole system there. And it's going to stop after I lay hands on you. You can whisper it to me when I get to you, but you don't, you don't have to come up for that one. Anybody's left shoulder get released, like I said? Partially. Josh, let's finish off that left shoulder right there. She got a partial healing. Okay, where's my line? Is it right here? I'm coming back into it. And there is a woman in here, your fallen bladder is going to get pulled up. I think that's what they call it. Weak bladder, fallen bladder, whatever you want to call it. 
When the guy gets a prostate thing, the woman's going to get a, a bladder thing. <laughs> get in line. I'm going to start right here. So get in line over there. No, I'm coming to you. I'll come to you. Yeah. Just get Anyone that's not had prayer, you better be in this final line. This is it. Are you in line? Yes. What do you have? Long COVID? Yeah. Yeah. And it's, I got foggy brain and. Uh, the Lord told me that I was going to have a new healing ministry after the COVID pandemic, getting people healed of long COVID. And once we get a few testimonies built up, people will be flying in from all over the world to get healed of long COVID, and we won't have to use a vaccine. The Lord gave me a word about it. I, I sat and I prayed. And I said, God, what are you going to do about all these people dying of vaccines and they can't get the vaccine out of their body? And he goes, oh, yeah, I'll take it out of their body. And I go, God, what's going to happen to all the people that have long COVID now? He said, I'm going to start healing them. It's just a whole new category of sickness for the church to start operating because we failed during COVID. So, Lord, I command every symptom in her body from head to toe that they call long COVID. <laughs> Healing power flow. <laughs> Jesus name. Ooh. I just got a, who's had migraines? Anybody? <laughs> How about that? I just happened to drift over migraines out of all the people. I even get surprised, by the way, because it's like the angel moves me around. I, I, I don't know if you know my testimony, but I move with a healing angel. He, he stands to my left, and he moves me around. He whispers in my ear. It could be the Holy Spirit. He doesn't have a form, so I don't know that it's not Holy Spirit. I call it the angel. The reason you have these attacks is because you have like a Daniel Joseph dream gift. More like Daniel, because Daniel rose above just having dreams to having influence in the cultures. Who says it just has to be in the church? So, Lord, I pray over him a Daniel Joseph mantle of the prophetic and command the migraines to be healed. Bam! It's the attack. What? Don't eat, you got to keep your fluids up.
get another hot flash. Feel that? I soaked you. Oh, I'm sweating again. You see that? It just hit me with him. It's like the Lord will come along and just pop me, fill me back up. You've got to have a lot of energy when you work in the healing lines. Yeah, thank you. So, sorry about that. I'm fresh. Okay, put your hands up. Lord, we need the healing anointing. Right when I said that, somebody had their jaw wired shut at some point, I think, from an accident. Is that you? Come here. I go into vision sometimes. I don't always feel it. I see it. <sighs> Arthritis of the jaw, TMJ, you having some problems? And by the way, the Lord doesn't have to give a word to every person. He, he puts it out just to get the faith back up in the room that he's here and he's moving because we get our eyes on what's going on sometimes and then the, you can feel the room dip. So then the Lord will come along and he'll hit me with a fresh anointing and then I'll call out a bunch of stuff, get the atmosphere up again and then you don't need that to get everyone healed because the healing anointing's here. I call the word of knowledge and encouragement. It produces faith. But I've also had people in a meeting go, God, if you want to heal me, let him call me out. And then I don't, then they don't get healed. Because they're waiting for a word rather than looking for the healing. So keep your eyes on the healing, not the word. The words are fun, but you can get a word tomorrow or a word Sunday. We don't know that there might be a meeting where I just prophesy all night. Thank you, Lord, for my healing. Bam! Double. All the way through your side, hip, all the way down. Now, do you feel anything as you're standing here? Heat, electricity, do you feel any sensation? I always ask. Because a lot of times when you get down to where the anointing is moving or testimonies are happening, it increases. So I always want to know what the Lord's doing. And when I ask sometimes, it's also because... I'm fascinated by how the Holy Spirit moves, even though I've seen it a million times. Because he always does it different with each person. The problem is we teach these principles as if they're the... And then we miss out on what God's doing. Sometimes people get healed and they feel nothing. It's not about getting someone to fall over either. I love that, but I'm secure enough in my anointing that if everybody stood up, I wouldn't care. I know that a lot of people are just holding on, but it's not about getting a certain manifestation. I'm trying to get people healed. So if I'm praying for you, I get into it a little bit, then you'll see me just grab my hand and pull you in because I want, I want to hold you up. And if you feel nothing, it's okay. Take all the pressure off. There's way too much pressure on ministry when it comes to healing. I hate pressure. And I hate people coming under pressure. And I don't operate, not that I feel pressure from you guys. I'm saying, don't put pressure on yourself. Let the Lord be the Lord. You don't have to, like, do anything. Just get in the line and get prayer. So some evangelists tell you different. They blame you when you don't get healed. Come back tomorrow when you don't get some more. Because it can't be me and God. It's got to be you. I hate that. We need more grace in this stuff. Okay, so what side bothers you more? Now, why would the Lord reveal such a specific word about the jaw and then not heal it? That's another question I have. People go, why words of knowledge? Not only does it lift the faith in the room, it delivers into the atmosphere, let there be light, there was light. If I didn't give the word of knowledge, that miracle may never manifest. It would stay in the invisible realm and not get pulled down into the natural realm. That's why words of knowledge are important. That's why the prophetic utterance is important because it's like faith. It's the currency that pulls on the divine. So you bring a word of knowledge out of what's existing in heaven. If you don't speak it here, it'll never show up here. That's what the Lord told me about the word of knowledge. 
And he said, he doesn't reveal if he ain't going to deal. He's not going to give an accurate word and then just leave you the way you are. That would be dumb. So I have great faith that the problems in her mouth, teeth, jaw, gums. And sorry I went a little longer, guys. This is the message. I like to teach as I go. I'm a teaching evangelist because evangelists are supposed to be activating, not just demonstrating how good they can move in the stuff. I want to get all of you activating, so I like to explain what's happening because then you learn the gift of healing, miracles, signs, wonders. And if you really want to learn, I have two books out there, one called Healing, one called Deliverance. That'll help you out. Okay. Tell me why you're here. Eyes. One has bleeds, one has fluid. Take glasses off. So when we were in Lakeland a few weeks ago, we had, I think the first night, it was like four people had something with their eyes healed. Come on over here, Jim. You had a, something in your eye. Let's pray together. Another thing I love to do is if you have two or three people in the room that have already been healed of something, why work so hard? If you were healed of cancer and two other people healed of cancer, they should be praying for the person that needs to be healed of cancer. So if you've been healed of an eye disease, start praying for eyes. One of my favorite miracles, and God owed this me this one. Granny wheat falls into the ground and dies, remains alone. My mom died deaf. I was born, she was deaf. So all my life, I had a deaf mom. She never had hearing aids, couldn't speak. I was an only child, had no dad. It was always frustrating. So I didn't turn out that good of a kid. And so uh, anyways, years later, I led my mom back to Christ. Two years after that, she suffered a massive stroke and died at 47 years old. Never got healed of deafness. I went to the Lord and I said, God, she died. And he goes, yeah, but watch this. And within a few years, a thousand deaf mutes were healed in my ministry. First one, Prince George, British Columbia, Canada. A woman looked like my mom, sounded like my mom. And somebody brought her to the altar and said, our mom is deaf. And I started crying. She's going to be my first deaf mute because my mom was never healed. And I laid hands on her. I was 22 years old. Boom, her ears popped open. Then after that, everywhere I went, anybody deaf I met, I prayed for. I had a 99% success rate in deaf ears. Only if they were totally deaf. Deaf in one ear or deaf in both. I was like 99%. I went to a meeting in India, had 139 deaf mutes healed. They sent buses and brought the entire deaf schools with the sign language. I said, get me the buses, and, and Saturday night I'll pray for all the deaf. And they went out to all the schools and brought all the deaf schools. Had 139 deaf mutes, they were all healed. The Lord said, I told you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies. So your mother's with me in heaven, and now you have a healing ministry for the deaf. Now I'm working on the blind. I'm seeing a lot more blind people get healed than I used to. Because sometimes you'll have an area where you're weak. Wheelchairs. Somebody else, that'll be their main anointing. Some other evangelist, will be all about the wheelchairs, but he won't get any deaf ears open. He won't get any blind eyes open, but he'll get all the wheelchairs. Guess what I started to do? I went, I'm tired of not having wheelchairs. God goes, well, pray for them first. So I started opening my meetings with praying for all the wheelchairs. And guess what? Once I started to get one, then I had five. Then I had ten. And I worked my way into a wheelchair healing anointing. Because it wasn't mine by default. Because the gifts of healings are called gifts of healings. You don't have them all. Nobody possesses all the gifts of healings. That's why it's plural, more than one healing gift. You get have a hundred healing gifts in one room. And they all be different gifts of healing. Do you know that? Same healer, but the gifts of healings is not the gift of healing. It's not the working of miracle. It's the working of miracles. Some people can work financial miracles. Some people can work creative miracles. So there's different types of the working of miracles. What you need to figure out on your teams is who's got what gifts. And start utilizing them if it's a weakness that you have until you build up your strength. That's another key to healing ministry for anyone that cares. How are you? What? How many years?
You know why some of the other healing ministries were the most successful healing ministries? Because they never hurried the prayer lines to get to the next meeting. I love laboring at the altars. It's my favorite thing to do, even, even above preaching. I could pray all night long. That's why Oral Roberts was successful, because he would take the time with the people. You ever meet those preachers that don't have time to take time for the people? It's like they're in a hurry. You've got to get time. Thank you, Jesus. Feel that? Yeah, move your hands. It's loose, right? There you go. Where's that? Uh, uh, water. Diabetes for 19 years. <sighs> How do I pray for diabetics? God, I pray for a brand new pancreas. I was in South Africa, and I had about 100 diabetics healed. Type 1. Let me just take this water for a minute. Give me two minutes. Yeah, move them all in. No double dippers. Remember I told you about the first couple prayer lines? Don't straggle in. That's called faith. Because now that you see God moving, everyone's like, I want in. Who's feeling any fire, heat, burning, electricity? Come here. Stand right here. What's your condition? You don't have one? No. I'm just... But you feel fire. Oh, yeah. How long have you been feeling it? Every time you walk near. Every time I walk by you. <laughs> Hold my hand. Father, I release to her body the healing anointing that's been on our ministry. Sometimes what you're actually feeling isn't just the healing anointing. You're actually feeling the angel when I'm walking around. Some people actually see it. Other people feel it. And it burns. And you know why? That's how I know it's with me. And by the way, sometimes it doesn't show up in meetings and people still get healed. It's just a manifestation that lets me know we're on another level. And that's usually how I move in the words of knowledge and deliverance and know what's going because the angel's telling me. I've been working with that since December the 5th, 2023 years. I'll tell you the story sometime. It's pretty amazing. I was in a meeting with a thousand people and all the prophets. And uh, an old man told me, I used to work for John G. Lake. He was ordained with John G. Lake came from Portland, Oregon to Grants Pass, Oregon and said, I brought an angel with me. This angel was with John G. Lake's healing ministry. The Lord told me to get in the car and drive down here and I would meet a 22-year-old evangelist named Todd Bentley and he would start walking in that anointing that John G. Lake had. And I was in a meeting where Paul Kane and William Branham designated a tabernacle of healing during the original Voice of Healing Revival in 1950. And then there was these other prophets, John Paul Jackson and Bob Jones and Bobby Connors and all these other prophets. And I was a 22-year-old evangelist out of Canada. They said, come on down to this meeting. We need a healing guy. We're all prophets. We hear you having a healing ministry. So I showed up with all these prophets that I didn't know. And I was 22 years old. And this old man comes into this tent meeting and says, hey, I brought an angel with me. I went, where is he? In the car? I kind of made fun of him. He said, he's standing at the back of the tent. And I looked, and boom, sure enough, there was an angel at the back of the tent. That night, that angel commissioned me to a ministry of healing. He's been traveling with me ever since. Some say that angel was also with William Branham. And that's how he would get the visions and the dreams and the words and all. And I've been working with that for 23 years. And that angel has showed up in seven revivals to announce the revival. So it'll show up the day of the revival, and God will say, revival starting Lakeland, revival starting Korea, revival starting South Africa. Every time I've had a revival, the angel will show up, and I'll see him, and he'll tell me, I'm the winds of change. I'm here for healing. Craziest thing. You don't need that for the ministry of healing, but how many of you love the supernatural? Come on, have your ears and eyes open. It's signs and wonders, not just healing and miracles, you see? Part of all this other stuff are signs and wonders. And we need more of this in the church because why let all the new age and let all the stuff in the world, I'm trying to do a meeting in Times Square. I'm renting Times Square in New York. You know why? Because I'm going to put up a big stage 
and I'm going to get up in New York and call people out of the crowd and just like they do with the psychics and all the other, I'm going to do it right outside of Fox News on the stage in Times Square and have testimonies of healing and pray for the sick. And I'll tell you, that'll get the attention. Now, what's that guy doing up there with the beard and tattoos? You know, because we need to showcase God's power outside the church. Why are you here? Right now? Put your hand there. Chest and shoulder. Oh, she's getting all kinds of messed up now. You know, it's a good meeting when people get healed and demons come out. We can call that church. It's called the kingdom. We talked about signs of the kingdom, and some of them are showing up. Hi. Why are you here? Hmm? You feel any heat or anything standing here? <laughs> Lord, let her feel the burning anointing. And I don't know why, but I'm going to say, you can look up the name and the person in the Bible named Miriam. But Miriam was the first one that song the, uh, sang the song of deliverance. I think it was Exodus 15. Once they were delivered, she grabbed the timbrel. She had prophetic. She had song. She had music. She had dance on her. And she sung a song about the song of the redeemed and deliverance. So I even see you singing and bringing people into deliverance. And you got that gift. You're a Miriam in the body of Christ. Look up Miriam, the name, and look up Miriam, the character. And God will give you more insight. Okay, why are you here? Ringing. Always? Tonight? At times. Did you call it tendonitis? Are you diagnosed with it? Just a weird symptom. You don't want to get checked. Have you had frequent infections when you were little? Tubes? What's your bothers you more than the other? The left. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm just listening to the Lord. I'm going to pray for your ear, and we're going to do a divine exchange. The Lord's going to anoint your ear on the left to be a hearing prophetic ear. And he's going to take care of the tendinitis, and you're going to develop a hearing ear for the Lord's voice. See, a lot of times healing isn't just healing. There's impartation. There's other things going on. Sometimes you can't get somebody healed until you bring the rest of what God's trying to do because sometimes physical things are connected to spiritual problems. And sometimes if you listen closing up, you'll go, it's not just a ringing in the ear. God's getting my attention here. She's going to have a hearing ear. She's going to have a prophetic ear. So now she'll be healed too. Why are you here? I called out the pain in your stomach and it's gone. You don't have any pain now. You were just hanging out over there. Did you have the lumps in there? Put your hand there. Ready? It's going to be like a fireball. Don't worry, I'm not going to hit you. The fireball might, but I'm not. Lord, let a fireball come. <laughs> Boom! Right there. I had a word about that. Come on, zap them, Josh. We're going to do it. Boom! The kidneys, too. By the way, Josh is a prophetic evangelist. He leads all of our teams to the streets. So don't just think he's working the sound and the TV and the book table. This guy has a healing gift, loves the kingdom, and he's an evangelist too. So if you want to pray for anybody, you can. Right shoulder. <laughs> and my hips. Extend it in the anointing. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, don't Feel it? Here it comes. One, two, bam! Hey, now, were you the one that I prayed for over here? Come here a minute. You weren't, were you? Who was that woman that was standing here? Oh, yeah, you. How are you feeling now? Is the heat gone? Put your hand on your heart. Say, Lord, thank you for impartation for healing that people I pray for are now going to be healed because the healing fire and the angel that walked by you 
has brought an increase in your life. So what am I praying for? Assist. Oh, I thought you said assist. What's disc? Put your hand there if you can. Close your eyes. Thank you, Jesus, for putting your hand right on our back where that slip disc was. It's almost like Jesus himself is just going to walk up and lay hands on your back. Bam. You feel any motion or any heat or anything at all? Can you move it? Was there pain before? Um, I feel it when I sit. You're never going to feel it again. Hold my hand. You feel that peace in the room? Pretty nice. Tomorrow we're going to get out the anointing oil. We'll have a bucket of oil tomorrow. Hint, hint. This is my last line, right? Because I don't want anyone straggling up. I'm counting the seven bodies in there. What? If I see a double dipper, I'm throwing them out. Tomorrow they're going to learn. We're going to tape off the altars. And if they're not up here for the first call, we're taping them off. Just close your eyes, everybody. I feel really something special coming into the atmosphere. I'm never in a hurry. That's why I don't do lunch early. My services always tend to go a long time, even when I think I'm going to be done in two hours. Guys, really pray because there's a holiness and a fear of the Lord coming in the room right now. We need to grab a hold of this. It's called the spirit of the fear of the Lord. It's not something we have of our own selves. You ever thought about that? Not that you don't fear the Lord, but I'm saying there's a spirit of the fear of the Lord. Why would we need the spirit of the fear of the Lord if we could just have the fear of the Lord? So it's time for the church to learn that there's another level of the holiness of God coming that has nothing to do with our ability and has everything to do with him. And the Lord told me this because I always felt like I wasn't a holiness preacher and I messed up too much of my life to be a holiness guy. And the Lord said, your holiness isn't on you. Your holiness is on me. So how many of you want to lift up your hands and just say, Lord, thank you. Yeah, bring her over here. Thank you for the fear of the Lord because it's the only thing that will enable us but you better not be doing it out of your own ability you got to let the Lord's fear touch your life it's amazing isn't it once I got that revelation I was never afraid of the fear of the Lord or holiness because I realized that when it touches you it'll make you live holy and whenever I had struggles in my past it's because I'd be trying to do things in my own strength but once you get the revelation of the grace and power of God, man, tell me, sweetie, how are you? How are you? Yeah. Let me take that mic. <laughs> I, I, do you mind if for like one minute, I'll just, for one minute. So I, no, it's, I want to be honest. Um, something I haven't been, oh, oh. Turn it up. <laughs> I want to be honest with um, myself and before other believers. Um, I had been running my whole life um, from a childhood molestation, uh, physical, sexual abuse. Um, I saw all sorts of witchcraft. I was opened up to all sorts of stuff when I was a little girl. Um, tormented by fear, the spirit of fear every day of my life, every moment of my life, literally. Um, 
was around um, a lot of people that um, in a mental hospital. My dad was a pharmacist, and so I was exposed to that. And so with that, my soul was opened up to a lot of different spirits that were not of God. Um, through that, then I went on, and surprise, surprise, the doctors said I had every possible thing wrong with my mind. Lies. I had been living lies, torment, hell every second of my life to the point where they tried every medicine and they said, you're treatment resistant. We're gonna shock your brain. Thank God that never happened. But I was willing to try anything in this world to be set free. My marriage started failing. Uh, got into ministry with my husband, James over there. Um, the first couple months, the, th the first three months after we got married, all of his sicknesses happened. I was left with, what do you do? You pull up your britches and you take care of your loved one. That's what you do. So I, beca I became his personal caregiver. Why? Because that's what love does. It fights. It's selfless. And I became very unhappy. Um, and the enemy tried to rob, steal, kill every single thing about us. But let me tell you, he remained steadfast in his faith. He continued to pray for me. I unfortunately got into deep depression and hooked on many different pills as well as illegal substances. And so we all have our stuff. Don't judge. We all have our stuff. Some are just open to tell about it and others aren't. But you know what? If we're truly honest with God and fully surrender, it is by the grace of God that I'm able to tell you all the truth for once in my life. I'm honored because I feel like I'm a little girl again. <laughs> and it's, it's exciting because <laughs> I'm excited, y'all, because I felt like I was so far away from jumping back into ministry with my husband. I'm not. We're excited, um, and we are so thankful for this night, and for Todd, and for God, most importantly. Do I feel what? Oh, I don't feel any pain, by the way. Mind, no anxiety, nothing. <laughs> so, thank you guys. We love you, and keep pressing forward, because if he can do it, it's possible. All things are possible, so... Fill up the house. Get in the word. Fill it up with presence, prayer. That was a great deliverance. So good. God had your number tonight. Me too. They call me tone deaf. My line? off those cataracts. Bam. Remember I got prayer my eyes legally blind. I had 30,000 people praying for me. One day I'll be driving to church and then they just popped open. So don't think because there's a delay that that anointing isn't moving forward and God's doing something. Yeah. God bless you. Thank you for serving. Where did you serve? Afghanistan, Iraq? Afghanistan. God bless.
bless him today. After all that service, we need him to have a new kingdom body. Somebody this weekend is going to get healed. They're not here tonight, I don't think. You know somebody with an enlarged heart. The heart's enlarging. So you need to get them here because they'll be healed. <sighs> Remove that tooth even from the ear. goes sometimes I don't even have to pray I just let the anointing come and not everybody responds the same why are you here How's that feeling? Less pain? Same pain? A little bit less? Did you feel, you just feel heat still? It's hot. It's hot. Give her another zap. Lord, we command the nerves in her legs and feet. They say nerves don't grow back. But I've seen nerves grow back. Because we serve a miracle God. I command them ankles. I command all pain go. I command all inflammatory go. Amen. Pastor Joel? Pastor Joel, you want to say anything? Oh. One more. God, what shirt is being Okay. 
thank you guys for hanging out, for being troopers, for not just trying to get and, and take off, but for celebrating what God is doing even right now. Uh, are we still streaming? Do we know? We are? Just in case? That's fine. 2632 Southwest 39th in Oklahoma City. Tomorrow night at 5 o'clock, which will be Saturday night at 5 o'clock. Sunday, 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, come be a part. See what God will do in your own life. God bless you guys. Have a great evening.